בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, we're back here on our Wednesday night, שיעור תורה, Wednesday night, where it's the stump the rabbi, where after some דברי תורה, you guys will uh, ask some questions, and בעזרת השם הקדוש ברוך הוא will give us the answers, lots of interesting things to learn tonight, tonight's uh, שיעור is uh, sponsored uh, by our very uh, dear friend, uh, Shmuel uh, uh, Levy, הקדוש ברוך הוא יברך אותו ואת משפחתו בכל מכל כל חיים ארוכים שלמים מלאים תורה מצוות וגמילות חסדים. Uh, tonight's show is also going to be for his הצלחה and also for the רפואה שלמה for רב אפרים בן שולמית, רבנית שרה בת ענת, רבנית לבנה בת שרה, אבי מורי דוד בן נסריה, אמי מורתי דוריס בת ז'ורה and all of עם ישראל and all the righteous Noahais that continue to learn with us and support all of the amazing things that the organization is doing, Baruch Hashem. Uh, just as a uh, brief update, uh, the uh, reminder for everybody, these books, Baruch Hashem, are going like, uh, what do they say, hotcakes? Okay, they're going like hotcakes. The, the uh, new English uh, slash Hebrew book that uh, Rabbi Ephraim and his Rabbanit uh, published uh, Baruch Hashem is being distributed all over the country and actually even a few places uh, out of the country. In Canada, in a couple of other countries, Baruch Hashem have stepped up to the plate and uh, ordered the, the books. We also have a couple of uh, schools have asked uh, for them to be uh, given to their, uh, to their students as curriculum, Baruch Hashem. So anyone that uh, wants to order themselves a box of 20 books or more, can go to uh, for free, uh, which is the best price. Uh, you can go to the kiruvstore.org, kiruvstore.org, K-I-R-U-V-S-T-O-R-E.org. Baruch Hashem, uh, over there you'll be able to get yourself a uh, box uh, that you can give to people in their hand. You can give to people as part of the Mishlach Manot. You can give to people in your community, Jewish community, uh, and uh, get people closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, so that's one. Second thing is, uh, we have uh, Purim. Purim is upon us. It's uh, what's literally right around the corner. There's a, a bunch of mitzvot that already begin now uh, for the uh, holiday of Purim. One of them is the machatzit uh, shekel, uh, the mitzvah of giving the machatzit shekel. This is an obligation for every Jew to give a machatzit shekel. Uh, and uh, during Purim, there is uh, not just a famous wearing a costume and mishloach uh, manot that people like to do, uh, but uh, more important than uh, both of them uh, is actually the matanot le'evyonim, to help the poor. One of the things that's been keeping us busy uh, over these uh, last few weeks is uh, preparing for our uh, Baruch Hashem annual uh, distribution to the poor, on uh, Purim, we're setting up again, uh, since we had a lot of success with it uh, the last uh, year, uh, we're setting up a uh, learning program for the holiday of Purim by a bunch of Avrechim and, uh, and young kids. They're going to be learning for several hours on Purim itself for the merit of those people that, uh, uh, that uh, donated uh, to help them, to feed them for the, for the holiday. Uh, these are tzaddikim that will be learning for your sake. So uh, anyone that uh, donates uh, for that uh, on our campaigns will certainly have a lot more than the typical matanot le'evyonim because you'll have Torah as well as helping the poor, as well as fulfilling the mitzvah. Uh, you can go to uh, bhpurim.org, bhpurim.org. Uh, that's B as in Be'ezrat, H as in Hashem, purim.org. And you can uh, donate as much as your heart allows. Uh, Hashem. So tonight is a parashat uh, vayekel, and really this time of the year is a uh, one of my favorite and least favorite at the same time. Now, how could that be? On one end, it's a time where we have to uh, do a lot of the operational stuff for the organization uh, that's always necessary. But now there's also uh, tax season. We have to prepare. Uh, the uh, the tax receipts for all of the donors for the past year. It's an enormous amount of work, and no matter how much help and preparation uh, I get each year, there's it's simply never enough, uh, and there's always a uh, a huge a huge amount of work that uh, we have to do uh, in that preparation. 
Uh, so on that end, it's uh, one of my least favorites because we still have to do everything else. We still have to do the shulim. We still have to learn Torah. We still have to teach and help all, all of our dear students around the world. And we still have to do our major campaigns to help the poor in Israel uh, in, uh, during this time. So it's an enormous amount of uh, things to do. Uh, so that makes it very difficult. On the other end, it's one of my favorites uh, because it's also a time, it's really the only time during the year where I get to know a little bit more about who's actually donating to the organization. Because during the year, I generally don't look at things. Uh, you know, I look at things once a month, usually just to see what came in, what came out. Uh, and that's it. I don't usually know if you're donating during the year or not, if you have a monthly donation, if you have a... Uh, uh, you know, uh, something that you're doing randomly. Usually the only ones that I do know about is uh, if uh, it's the holiday donations uh, where uh, during Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, because for those people I have to pray for, uh, or if somebody's making an exceptionally large donation and they uh, uh, need my guidance from it or, or, or they, uh, they, they just want to let me know about it. But generally speaking, uh, there's a lot of people that donate uh, quietly throughout all of the year and uh, I only get to know about it now. So it's wonderful to see uh, some of the uh, people that support, that help us, that care about uh, what we're doing so much that they're willing to put their hard-earned money behind it. Uh, and this is uh, something that has everything to do uh, with our parasha, our parashat pikudet. Uh, because one of the things that uh, a person you know, and not just one, not two, not ten, not a hundred, not even a thousand. People have asked me uh, endless times, and I'm sure other rabbis have been asked the same question, is how do you know if your tshuva is being accepted by Hashem? Meaning, how do you know if you're doing good or not? Now, of course, everyone knows the obvious. If you're violating Shabbat, you're not doing good. If you're wasting seed every day, you're not doing good. If you're still walking around with, uh, without clothes on, uh, and, uh, and, you know, you're, you're not doing good. Now, unfortunately, some people are uh, clueless about this. And as we'll see later tonight from one of the stories uh, of the Baba Sali that I uh, just learned today, uh, that uh, some people don't even know the importance of that. But uh, even more so, a person can be doing tshuva, can be going on the right path, but still be on the side of the klipa, meaning the side that you don't want to be on. And the same thing even goes for people that are already frum. There are plenty of frum people that are extraordinarily righteous tzaddikim that you could literally smell the kedusha and and and, and you know from from a far away, you can see how they live their life. And then there are some reshaim, wicked people that happened to wear a kippah, that happened to cover their head, and even sometimes happened to cover their body and walk around modest, but we extremely wicked, like these criminals that are being prosecuted by the Attorney General uh, of New York uh, for their uh, predatory business of uh, merchant cash advance that we've been speaking against for the last uh, five or six years, if not more, uh, and as I've said it once and I've said it twice in all of the lectures, uh, in the end, this is not only going to create uh, an enormous amount of damage for the economy, for the small businesses, these predatory lenders uh, are uh, going to cause a damage to our community, our Jewish community. And this is the reason why we have to continue speaking against them uh, because uh, they are literally evil people that are destroying uh, any part of society that they're being uh, allowed to uh, be a part of. Uh, but they walk around and sometimes they pretend to be a, uh, you know, religious. Sometimes they uh, pretend that they're proud of their Judaism. But I can assure every single person that's watching this, they do not present Judaism. They are not considered religious. They are considered reshaim that have no share of the world to come until they do tshuva. And uh, I'm afraid that some of the things that I already mentioned years ago uh, is actually coming to a head where uh, this business is uh, going to end up being shut down. This entire industry will ultimately be shut down. People will end up going to jail, lose all of their money, 
And uh, what's happening right now is just the beginning. It's just small, small tokens. So anyone that's still uh, delusional enough to be in that business or think that business is kosher, give it time uh, and you'll see for yourself all of the words of the sages that come true. This is not my words. This is all the words of the sages that we mentioned over the years in the lectures. We have a playlist of lectures about uh, the predatory lending industry and uh, how we want to make sure to distance ourselves away from those reshaim. Uh, as Moshe Rabbeinu said to Am Israel, stay away from those people. Stay away from those wicked people lest you get punished just for being next to them. Oy la rasha, oy le shcheno. Woe to the uh, wicked and woe to his neighbor. Even if you have the permission from the government, even if you have the permission from your local rabbi, in Shemaim, you do not have a permission. Why? It's immoral, it's not right, it's a bad product. And you would not want to buy it. So the first thing that you should know is rule of thumb. If you wouldn't be a customer, don't sell it. That's the rule number one. Two, if the commissions are really high, usually that's a problem. Why? Nobody likes to pay high commissions for good products. Good products sell themselves. If the commission's very high, there's usually something wrong. Three, if you see a specific group of people focus and all of a sudden there's new businesses selling the same product popping up like, like, uh, like mushrooms everywhere. All of a sudden everybody's in the cash advance business. All of a sudden everybody's in the insurance business insuring uh, washing machines. All of a sudden everybody's selling uh, you know, uh, this. Everyone's selling this. Why? There's a scam. There's a scam. Uh, Baruch Hashem, I've been, I've, been around, I've been alive for a long time. Baruch and it's important uh, that, uh, that a person know what, uh, what is actually being uh, said in the Torah. And as a correction to what I said before, it's Parashat Vayekil, not Parashat Pikude. So with that being said, it's a, uh, don't worry, everything is prepared. Everything is known. Everything is, a, uh, is, is in front of us, Barizat Hashem. Uh, but the, the key is to understand that uh, this... Predatory lending industry is not a representation of the Jewish people in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and, uh, but at the same token, some of these people are giving the so-called free ride, free ride in the community because they donate a lot of money. So if somebody donates a lot of money, does that mean that they're righteous? Does that mean that they're righteous? Uh, is, is if, if somebody... Is a uh, you know is a big spender in the Jewish community. Is that making him righteous? So we're going to see. We're going to see. And uh, again, it's Parashat Vayekel, and we're going to see what our Holy Torah tells us. Because everyone wants to know where they stand. Everyone wants to know if they're on the side of the klipa or they're on the side of the Kedusha. And tonight, Parashat Vayekel is going to uncover one of the hidden tests that the Zohar Kadosh tells us about uh, in regards to knowing where you stand. And in fact, it is a very, very easy test to do. You can do it without supervision. You can do it as we speak. I suggest you think about it, but you won't have to think much. 30 seconds, you probably already have it. Now, some of you are going to be happy. You're going to be elated. Once you do this do-it-at-home do test, you're going to be happy. Why? You'll know you're standing in good place. As long as you continue... Good for you. Olam Abba is being prepared for you as we speak. On the other hand, some of you are going to be disappointed. Ah, man, I thought that I was doing better. Don't lose any hope. 
this is not to insult anyone this is not to degrade anyone this is simply a status check so we all know where we stand in order for us to either continue doing good or improve and of course without a shadow of a doubt some of you are going to continue choosing to live in denial and i'm not referring to the river in egypt i'm talking about living in denial thinking that ah come on the rabbi is making it up as if i have some type of vested interest to make stuff up so with that being said rabotai karim let's dig in to this beautiful parasha and see what we can learn in the beginning of the parasha we see something unusual now anytime you look into the torah you're going to find something but there are times there are certain things that are not just beautiful not just interesting but they're unusual because it seems like it's like a puzzle piece that fits just right in but you don't really know what it's going to do yet now this entire parasha is talking about building the mishkan all of the things we talked about in the last couple of parashot all of the construction of the mishkan the menorah the aron kodesh all of the different amazing things that were there and the whole parasha talks about the details but yet in the beginning of the parasha Hashem sticks a couple of sentences in there that seem like they don't fit where it says Moshe assembled the entire assembly of the children of Israel and he said to them these are the things that Hashem commanded to do them now we're thinking oh yeah we're going to continue what we already been doing for the last couple of weeks building the Mishkan no for six days work may be done but the seventh day shall be holy for you a day of complete cessation before Hashem anyone who does work on it shall be executed you shall not light fire in any of your dwellings on the Shabbat day And then it goes back to the Mishkan. That's it. So we have a one of the 12 times in the Torah that Akadosh Baruch Hu tells us and warns us about Shabbat and how a Jew must observe every Shabbat without exception. And those that violate it at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, at the time of the Sanhedrin, would be executed today it's a spiritual death penalty what's a spiritual death penalty tragedies you don't want to know of a person would die young before the age of 50 or would live to see his own children die and all types of horrible things that are in essence the way that akadosh bahu fulfills the death penalty as the gemara tells us even though the Sanhedrin is no longer here to implement the four different types of death penalties according to the Torah that does not mean that the death penalty is no longer valid it just means that Hashem took over and he implements them in different ways he doesn't kill right away just like the Bedin that has a strategy of how they do certain things there has to be a warning there has to be an explanation the person has to know what they're doing and what the ramifications are there has to be witnesses same thing with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, where he also has a system of when he decides to execute somebody but the question still remains what is it doing here these couple of sentences about Shabbat seem like they don't fit if you told me about this in next week's parasha the week after fine but why is it here just and especially it's only a couple of sentences you have to keep shabbat we heard already we have to keep shabbat we've been hearing about shabbat already for the entire book of exodus why do we have to be reminded of it again 
That's because, Rabotai Yekarim, in last week's parasha, we learned about the horrible sin that Am Yisrael made the mistake by following the Erev Rav with the golden calf. The golden calf's sin is something that Am Yisrael is still suffering for until today. This idolatry was something awful that Am Yisrael had to get punished for in different ways. Those that Mamash worshipped the idol, they got killed by the water that Moshe Rabbeinu made them drink. Those that sinned a little bit. The Gemara says, Moshe Rabbeinu and the Levi tribe killed them with the sword. Killed them with the sword. Those that thought about sinning. They didn't quite sin, but they thought it's a good idea. I'm about, they're on the way to go do it. Akadosh Baruch Hu killed them with the plague. The plague that followed. But then there was those that didn't sin, but they watched their brothers and, and sisters, their fellow Jews, sin and they didn't say anything. They didn't rebuke. And they're being punished until the day. For that as the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that if a Jew sees another Jew making a biblical sin he must rebuke him and if he doesn't he'll get the same punishment as him in so many words he's considered as if he sinned himself so after this golden calf and Hashem forgave us but with a condition we need a tikkun we need a rectification HaKadosh Baruch Hu reminds us the rectification for Avodah Zarah is observing Shabbat. When you observe Shabbat, like you're supposed to, you know the laws, you know what to do, you're celebrating Shabbat, it's not like a burden on you. You learn Torah on Shabbat, you're not talking business on Shabbat. That's a tikkun for Avodah Zarah. And what is it doing here? Because we need a tikkun for the mistake we made. In Parashat Kitisa. And therefore, before we get into building the Mishkan, we have to know observing Shabbat is required in order for you to turn your own house into a house of Hashem. This is why Rule 101, for all people that want to be in love with Hashem and for Hashem to be in love with them, for them to have a share in the world to come, for their tshuva to even begin they must observe Shabbat. Without observing Shabbat, no mitzvah that you're doing is going to be rewarded in Olam Abba. Why? Because you have no Olam Abba that's good. Any mitzvah that you do, you'll get rewarded in this world. Because a Jew that does not keep Shabbat has no share of the world to come. So here HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling us, yes, I want you to build the house of Hashem, the Mishkan, but I also want you to turn your house 3,000 years later into a house of Hashem. You want it to be a house of Hashem? It begins with Shabbat. It begins with Shabbat. You want to do tshuva? It begins with Shabbat. You don't keep Shabbat? No tshuva. Now is tshuva, is, is, is Shabbat enough? It's a big mitzvah. But it's not enough to remove a person from the klipa. That's why the parasha continues with more details. And we're going to see how they're all connected. HaKadosh Baruch Hu then starts giving Moshe Rabbeinu the instructions of what to do. And Moshe Rabbeinu tells those instructions to Am Yisrael. Moshe Rabbeinu tells Am Yisrael, take for yourselves a portion before Hashem. Everyone whose heart desires to donate shall bring the portion before Hashem gold silver and copper so here we see that Moshe Rabbeinu is repeating what HaKadosh Baruch Hu already told him in the previous portions of the Torah which is each person needs to know that when they're giving when they're donating money to publicize Torah to help Talmidei Chachamim to help people do tshuva they are giving to them 
But in reality, they're going to receive a lot more than they give. Not receive a lot more money only, but they receive a lot more merits. If a person truly knew how much value each mitzvah is, they would literally have no time to do anything else but mitzvot. That's why the Chachamim teach us, grab and take, grab and take all of the mitzvot as much as you can. Because you don't know how much time you have left in this world. So Moshe Rabbeinu tells them to give, to give, to give of themselves. But he uses specific words. Everyone whose heart desires to donate. Meaning, there's no obligation to give all of your money. There's no obligation to give only a little bit. But rather, give whatever your heart desires. Because what you're giving is you're giving for the sake of sanctifying Hashem's name. Now, the Me'at Tzori says that this connection between Shabbat and giving and building of the Mishkan is because the building of the Mishkan cannot be done on Shabbat. It cannot be done on Shabbat. So even though you're building the house of God, it has to be done during the six days. Furthermore, this giving is not just everyone gives and everyone is judged the same. Rather, Moshe Rabbeinu is telling us, you're going to be judged based on what you give and how much you give. Does that mean that if you give a lot, automatically you're righteous? Not necessarily. Does that mean that if you give a little, you're automatically wicked? Not necessarily. So how do we know? We see what else Moshe Rabbeinu said. Moshe Rabbeinu says, All the wise-hearted people among you shall come and make everything that Hashem has commanded. Again, Moshe Rabbeinu is talking to the people with symbolic language. Not just telling them, come give, each person gives one shekel. Or each person gives 1% or 10% or 20% of their money. No, no, no. He says initially, give whatever your heart desires. Then he's telling them, if you're wise-hearted, meaning if you know what's good for you, spiritually speaking, you shall come and bring everything that Hashem said into a priority in your life. And then in verse number 21, he says again, every man whose heart desired came and everyone whose spirit it perfected him. Everyone whose spirit perfected him brought a portion before Hashem. See here, we're seeing the third stage. Your heart desires, good. You prioritize it and you're a wise-hearted person, good. But then it says something, wait, who gave in the end? Everyone whose heart desired came and whose spirit perfected them. Well, if their heart desired to give, doesn't that mean that their spirit, their spiritual status is perfect? No. As one of my very dear students asked me, if it's saying over here that everyone whose spirit perfected them came, doesn't that imply that not everyone gave, or at the very least, not everyone's spirit was perfected despite everything that's happened, whether it's the miracles in Egypt, Kriyat Yam Suf, Mount Sinai, the forgiveness for the sin of the golden calf, even after all of this, there was still some stingy people? Yes. 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 In fact, Rabotai, this is the test that all of you want to know. How do you know if you are on the side of the Shechina or the Klippa? We see here that some people gave and that giving showed that their spirit was perfected them. 
obviously if they gave they desire to give but they also got the extra sign from Hashem that this type of giving shows that their spiritual status has been perfected they're on the side of the Shechina they're on the side of the Kedusha the holiness on the other hand some people give and although they desired to give they gave after all their type of giving showed that they're not exactly perfect in fact they are still on the side of the klipa how would one know what's what because there's a different types of givers there's a person that gives and donates to Be'ezrat Hashem as an example and they let's say between them their you know household let's say makes a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year now it's a respectable living certainly it's a uh, comfortable but by no means is it rich especially if you live in places like New York Los Angeles different you know florida some of these places just uh, to pay your rent or mortgage is pretty much uh, almost uh, 50 percent of your salary you know as one person recently published that you know americans are very often making fun of people from other countries that are making less money but not realizing that yes you may be making you know uh, your five or ten thousand dollars a month but when half of your money is going to rent a mortgage and the other half is going to bills and you're left with nothing like most americans don't really have much of a savings account most americans have a uh a debt uh that they really can't afford uh in fact the uh the debt crisis that's looming over america and the rest of the world is unlike any other time in history to the point where uh the uh if if the economy uh slows down even a little bit the domino effect that will happen uh, will be uh, worse than anything we've ever seen, including the crash of 2007 and 2008. And we're already seeing signs of that happening as we speak from the commercial real estate industry, where it's, there's a lot of defaults as a changing market. Banks are defaulting, uh, needing a rescue. But it looks good because technology is doing good and there's obviously certain things that are doing well. But that's still the illusion the illusion that uh happens right before the collapse whenever that collapse may be the collapse may be next week the collapse may be in a year from now or two years from now either way certainly we know that there is cracks in the economy as we speak but the point being is is that making a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean the person has a lot of money i remember when i lived on wall street and I spoke to a business owner over there and I you know that was very very uh, familiar with the uh, New York market and you know he's been in New York for many years and I told him, what's the difference between this place you know this area versus other pla- parts of uh, New York and he said this area of New York is high income earners meaning people that make a lot of money they don't necessarily have a lot of money but they make a lot of money make 500,000 a million two million five million but they don't necessarily have a lot of money other parts of New York that we were talking about, he says, over there, they have a lot of money. They may or may not make a lot of money, but they have a lot of money. So sometimes people make a lot of money, but they don't necessarily have a lot of money. So there's a person that could be making a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year, and he's giving or she's giving $20,000, $40,000, 10 or 20% of their income to the organization Be'ezot Hashem that we run to help us publicize the Torah, help people do tshuva, help people convert, help people get closer to Hashem, help people eat. Respectable amount of money, significant percentage of what they make. Fantastic. They get guidance from the organization, they get uh, questions answered from time to time whenever they need. But they are constantly giving on the other hand there's also other people that give 
They give $100 here and there, $200 here and there. But they live in a $2 million apartment. They live in a $3 million house. Now, is the giving between the two the same? Absolutely not. But it's not because of the total amount of money. Rather because it's the total of percentage. Where one is giving 10 or 20% of what they have to publicize Hashem's name, and the other one is not even giving a tenth of a percent. But if you ask both of them, they both love Rabbi Reuven or Rabbi Ephraim or Rabbi Shavit or one of the rabbis of the organization, Rabbi Lev. They love them. Has their lives been changed? Absolutely. Changed my life. Have they uh, given you any guidance? Absolutely. Have they helped you in ways that you've asked? Absolutely. Have they uh, given you free stuff? You know, books, USBs. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They send uh, sometimes even too much. Oh, so wait. So this one gives 10, 20% of their money. The other one gives not even 1%. And in fact, the second one that gives less has a lot more money. Just their house is worth more than the first example. How come? That's what the Torah is talking about. Everyone's heart desired to give. Everyone likes, if you're watching Rabbi Reuven's lecture, you're watching Rabbi Ephraim's lecture, you're watching Rabbi Lev's lecture, you're watching Rabbi Shalvit, Rabbi Naim, uh, Rabbi Didi, uh, uh, and, and the rest of the rabbis of our organization. If you're watching our lectures, obviously, you like it. You like it, you're motivated by it, you're inspired by it, you're learning from it. Sometimes you contact and you ask additional questions. Good. Continue asking. So everyone's heart desires to give, to help, to give back a little bit. But there's a different giver. One giver gives with all of his heart. I'm going all in here. I'm going to fulfill my obligation because I know that publicizing a Kadosh Bahu's name through them is good. Why? Because it helped me. If it helped me, it can help other people. Another person that's getting just as much help will say, yeah, I love them. They helped me. They changed my life. Best rabbi in the world. And I'm going to send them money when I remember to. But I don't understand. You desire and you desire. We ask you, if you like it, you like it, both are going to say the same. You're both going to ask, you're both going to answer the same questions the same exact way. So how come the, the percentage giving is so radically different? That's when the Chachamim tell us, that's how you know if their spirit has been perfected. What does it mean spirit has been perfected? If right now you are on a status of giving, you just want to give, give, give. Your main priority in life is to give. You want to give. You wake up in the morning, I want to look for an opportunity to give. Who can I give? Oh, I can give my wife a compliment. Who else can I give? Oh, I can give my kids a hug. Who else can I give? I give the rabbi some help. I can give him a ride to shul. I could, uh, you know, I, uh, give him some money so he could do whatever it is that he needs to do. I can give to the poor. I could do all these giving. I could just give. Once in a while, you get, but you're not looking for getting. You're not looking for a woman to marry based on her meeting your to-do list. Oh, she has uh, this uh, this height, this color hair, this uh, bank account, this uh, preferences, this uh, amount of uh, this, this amount of that. Okay, she can give me. You're not looking for somebody to marry based on what they give you. You're looking for somebody to marry based on what you can give them. Oh, I see her. I can help. I can help make her even better. I can see how I can do something to make her happy i can do something to make him happy the reason why most people either don't find somebody to marry or once they get married they don't want to be married anymore is because they're constantly looking to take 
And when the other side can't give them what they want, they don't want it anymore. People don't go into relationship with a number one objective of giving. They figure, listen, I am what I am. I'm enough. I'm enough. I'm a prize. I'm already giving. What are you giving exactly? Well, I'm a nice person. So I have some money. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll cook and clean for him. I'll, uh, you know, buy her some presents. So what's, how's that giving? Why, that's not giving? No. If your priority is what she can do for you, if your priority is what he can do for you, you're not a giver. You're a taker. If your priority is what is everybody going to do for me, you're not a giver. You're a taker. Does that make you a bad person? Not necessarily. But you're not a tzaddik. You're not a tzaddika. And your tshuva is not exactly yet at the level of kedusha. Why? If you're at the level of kedusha, you're constantly looking for opportunities to give. Give, give, give. Why? You want to be like Hashem. Hashem only gives. He takes nothing. But if a person desires good, but he gives little and takes a lot more than he gives, and he's looking to take more, and he wants more, and she wants more. Can you do this for me? Can you answer for me? Can you go for me? Can you do this for me? Me, 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 me. If me is constantly in their sentences, or I, and me, and I, and me, and how can you do for me? And how about I? And how about me? Me, me? Unfortunately, you are in a status of not Kedusha. You're in a sort of Klippa. Klippa. When a person reviews themselves and sees, yes, listen, you know what? I'm inspired. I like, but I'm also getting a lot more than what I'm giving. And in fact, when you do uh, checks and balances, you see, I'm not even giving anything. Either literally, I'm not giving anything, or I'm not giving anything relative to what I'm getting. That means you're on the side of klipa. But if a person is giving on a regular basis to their spouse, to their children, to their work, to their customers, to, to their inspiration, then you're on the side of, you're on a good side. If you're giving for the Torah, if you're constantly giving to the Torah, that's also good. You could be on the side of Kedusha. And that's why the giving is very indicative. It's very, very uh, uh, clear. Do it yourself test to know whether you are on the side of the Shechina, the side of the Kedusha, or you're on the side of the Klippa. If you're a giver, you could be on the side of the Shechina of Kedusha, of holiness. If you are a taker, that means you are certainly on the side of the Klippa. Now a person could say, wait, listen, Rabbi, I, I want to give, but I don't have any money. I just lost my job. I, uh, I'm having a tough time. I got high bills. I got medical, ex medical expenses. Who said anything about you have to give money? It's not just money that you have to give. As one of my other students told me the other day, listen, I don't know, maybe I should be, uh, you know, uh, slowing down some of the learning so I can make more money because that way I could also support more Kiruv. And then he got a response from me that he wasn't expecting, which was, who said that God wants your money right now? What? Have you ever heard a rabbi tell you who said that God even wants your money? Usually it's if you donate for the Torah, it's good. And you're right, donate for the Torah is good. But doesn't mean that it's good from you. Sometimes Hashem doesn't want your money. But your Shema Yisrael that you say every single day says that you have to give to a Kadosh Baruch Hu to publicize the Torah all of your heart, all of your life, and all of your possessions. And your possessions are not always something that you can see in a bank account or a stock portfolio. But rather, 
What you truly have is not money. What you have is skill set. You have a specific skill that can help publicize the Torah, publicize Hashem's name. You have time where even if you don't have a skill set, that time that you can dedicate to publicize the Torah by arranging lectures, by, by uh, publicizing uh, shirim, by uh, giving out books, that certainly is giving of yourself. Sometimes HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want your money, but He wants your skill set that He gave you. He wants the talent that you have. He wants the time that you have. He wants the profession that you have. Sometimes He wants your connections. You know rich people that you can direct them to donate to publicize Hashem's name. Those are your assets. It's, your assets are not necessarily, your spiritual assets are not necessarily always money. The way that you can give for the sake of Hashem, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's not. Sometimes even if you want to give a lot of money, you don't have to give. But you can still be a giver. And you can still be on the side of Kedusha. How? I'm giving everything I have. I have a skill set, I'm going to use that skill set. I have time, I'm going to use that time. I have connections, I'm going to use those connections. Whatever I have that a Kadosh Baruch Hu blessed me with, I'm going to use that in order to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name. And when a person is constantly on the path of giving, they're going to look for any way that they can give. Now, what if you have money and you have a skill set? Do you give the skill set or the money? If you want to be on the side of Kedusha, the side of Shechina, you give both. Why? Because that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded us. When he said to us, Bekol me'odecha, all of what you have, all of your possessions. You happen to be blessed extra where some of your possessions is time, skill set, uh, connections. But you also happen to have money too. You have to give full force with everything you have. Full force with everything you have. Why? Because that's what's going to show that your giving is a sign of your perfection. Now, of course, there are some people to say, ah, come on, no. I have responsibilities. My house has a big tax bill every year. My business is not doing as well as it did last year. My kids' tuition is sky high. And of course, everybody has whatever excuses they want to listen to. But at the end of the day, a person is going to have to answer for everything. And one of the things a person has to answer for is how come you that make five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month, you cannot even sign up to give a hundred dollars a month. A phone bill. In America, a phone bill is fifty, a hundred dollars a month. You can't even sign up to give five fifty or hundred dollars a month, but a child, teenager, 15, 16 years old, that only makes a couple hundred dollars a week, giving out newspapers, he can. How come the 15 year old, the 16 year old can? When my bank called me today, they said we want our compliance department is asking some questions. I said, what's the questions? We have a nonprofit organization. Everything is legit. Everything is audited. Everything is taken. No, no, we don't have any questions about the nonprofit organization. I said, oh, so what's the questions about? He goes, no, per- the question's about your personal account. My personal account? What do, you, what do you care about my personal account? He goes, no, we're, we see that, you know, your organization... You guys get donations and then you give, you know, you give to poor people in Israel, you give to, you know, distribution of books, you give all this stuff. But then in your personal account, you're doing the same thing. You just send the money with the few expenses that you have, the rent, everything else you give. Why are you giving? Is this money that people are giving you to give? Like, are you taking other people's money so you can give? Is this like a really a, another business? I said, no, 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 it's my personal account. So 
Who are these people that you're giving to? So poor people, people that need. But aren't you already doing that on your personal account? And you're in the, in the corporation and the nonprofit? I said, yeah. So why are you doing it with your personal account too? I said, because I don't need all of that money. If I have extra, I give. If somebody needs, I give. That's what we do. We're givers. She was a little confused. She goes, she doesn't understand. Isn't the world just chasing money so they can accumulate more? But that's the problem. People don't understand. If you love Hashem, you want to emulate Him. You want to be a giver. You don't want to be a taker. If you happen to need help, no problem. Somebody gives you, no problem to take. But you don't want to be a taker where you're constantly looking for people that give you stuff even when you don't need. Like a few times already, it's happened over the years where somebody asked me, listen, Rabbi, I see that you have these high-end tefillin on your uh, website. Uh, Can I have one? Of course, even though I already know what they mean, I play stupid. And I say, yeah, you could just go to the website and just pick whichever one you want and then put your credit card in and order it and we'll send it to you within, you know, a little bit of time, a week, two weeks, a month, depending if we have to order it or if... No, 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 can I just have one? What do you mean you have one? You, can, can I just give you $2,000 tefillin? Why? Oh, you know, I don't really have one. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't have one? Didn't you say you, you, you keep Shabbat? You keep, yeah, but you know, it's my tefillin that I have are not like yours. Oh, so you do have tefillin. You just want a free one. That's much better than what you have. Yeah, but it'll make me much holier. And it'll, uh, you know, I mean, don't you want me to be holier? (laughs) It's great when people want to be holy on other people's accounts. Wonderful. These are takers. These are takers. The worst ones are the ones that pretend like they don't have, but in reality they have, and they pretend like they don't have because they want to take. They want to take. So the Torah is telling us here, that we have to be givers because our giving, especially our giving in our relationship with Hashem, where we're giving to publicize His name, we're giving of our time to learn His Torah, to help His people. That giving is symbolic of where our neshama stands. If we're constantly taking we have a work to do to get ourselves out of the klipa. Now, it's not just about giving. It's also about what you give. You know, because you know you have sometimes weddings. People invite people to weddings. And of course, the couple is expecting people to give them gifts. Rightly so. You go to a wedding, you have to give a gift. But every wedding has some smiles and disappointments at the end. Why? Because when the couple looks at who gave them what, they see that some people were really generous. Wow, look at this guy, this uncle this, brother this, friend this, colleague this. Gave a lot. Look, wow. So nice of them. But then they see this other person that not only didn't give much, didn't even give enough to cover the cost of having them there. It cost $150, $200 to, to feed this person for the night in this, in, this, uh, in this wedding. But he only gave them a $50 check. Now, If he was poor, he doesn't have, that's one thing. Everybody would know. But it's never so. Usually, they have a bunch. They make money. They just don't like to give it. That's a person that is definitely still on the side of klipa. If you have money for the sake of saving it only, you're spiritually unhealthy. Saving is good, but not at the cost of serving Hashem and being decent to your spouse, to your children, to the people in your life, to the Torah. 
So when a person goes to a wedding and they don't even give enough to cover the plate, it's best that they find a way to give in other ways. To at the very least make up for it in some ways. But it's still not necessarily making up for it. Now, what you give counts. It's not just giving that counts. What you give. Where do we learn that from? We see here. The men were bringing, in verse number 22, chapter 35, the men were bringing with the women everyone whose heart the desired brought bands, bracelets, rings, and machoch. What's this machoch? Every kind of gold ornament and every man who raised a raising of gold before Hashem. Machoch. What is this machoch? What is this machoch, Rabotai? The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 64, says machoch was a sort of a garment that was made out of precious metals and used for sensuality, for women specifically, to entice their husbands and so on. Why would they give this? Before we answer that, we see that later on, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu commands Moshe Rabbeinu to build the kiyol with copper, and Moshe Rabbeinu sees the copper that was donated was predominantly the mirrors of the women. In those days, the mirror was made out of copper. And Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want it. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, No! You take, that, you take those mirrors and you make the holy kiyo from it. That the Kohanim are going to wash their hands and feet to sanctify themselves before serving in the Bet HaMikdash, before serving in the Mishkan. Because they use those mirrors for good. And they have done tshuva. How do we know they have done tshuva? Because they also gave their machoch or in Hebrew it's called kumas. They gave those tools, those clothings, those garments for sensuality, for beautification, for, for, for things that in essence, instead of making them attractive, it made them attracting. And there's a very big difference. Because they gave away, they sacrificed their sensuality I'm accepting their tshuva. I'm accepting what they're giving with open arms. When a woman wants to know whether she is close to Hashem or not, she has to review what has she sacrificed for Hashem. When a man wants to review whether he's close to Hashem or not, he has to review what has he sacrificed for Hashem? Not because Hashem needs anything from you, Chas v'shalom. He is perfect. But rather, how much is this relationship with Hashem worth to you that you are sacrificing to Him? And as we know, sacrifices are done every day at the Bet HaMikdash. And we are supposed to make sacrifices for Hashem every day. Sometimes the sacrifice is time. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's attention. Sometimes it's kavod. Sometimes it's sacrificing a bad habit. A horrible character trait. What have you sacrificed? If you are still walking around the street hoping for everyone to look at you and compliment your beauty, you still have yet to sacrifice the ultimate sacrifice to Hashem. If you're still walking around as a show-off with your fancy watch, but your tefillin are still from the days of Antiochus, you still have not sacrificed enough. If you have no problem spending two, three thousand dollars to go on vacation, two, three thousand dollars on a watch, two, three thousand dollars 
on all types of hobbies that you have, but you're not willing to spend that on tefillin. You're not willing to spend that on publicizing Torah. You're not willing to spend that on a mitzvah like an etrog that you're only going to use for a week. But you have no problem spending it on vacation. You have no problem spending it on a watch or a series of watches. Then you, my dear friends, still are on the side of the klipa. You need to work on it. You need to get yourself out of the klipa. Why? Your giving, your nature of giving is an indication of where your soul stands. If you are a taker, your soul is in the side of the klipa. You need to get it out of there. and Stop keeping it there like a hostage. If you are with a nature to constantly give, the main thing you need to check is that you're giving to the right places. How do you know you're giving to the right places? Whether you're receiving blessings in your life. Sometimes blessings come in a form of money. Sometimes blessings come in a form of good health. Sometimes blessings come in a form of spiritual health. Sometimes blessings come in the fact that you're closer to Hashem, in your learning, different blessings to different people. But nonetheless, if you're giving to the wrong places, it could even be worse than, gi- than not giving at all. As Rabbi Nachman in Breslev says, giving to the wrong places is the equivalent of wasting seed. Shalom. Now, one of the great examples of someone that gave nonstop to be the soldier, the ultimate soldier of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that lived in recent generations was the Baba Sali. The Baba Sali reached a level of holiness that miracles became second nature to him. When he went, he was living in Netivot, but he would go and travel from time to time, and he had an apartment in a different place. And one time he came to this apartment only to find three thieves, three burglars inside the house, full of bags of the stuff that he had. He had all types of fancy, beautiful things in the house. But these burglars were scared to death when they saw the Baba Sali. Not because Baba Sali was big and strong, but rather because they couldn't understand, how did you come in here? He says to them, what are you doing here? They told him, we're stealing stuff. So how come you're still here? We couldn't find the door. Ah, you couldn't find the door, huh? Yeah, how did you get in? Right there. They look like, where? Right there, the door. They can't see a door. Please, we've been here for a few hours. We can't find the door. Help us. He said, put back everything you stole. Empty out your bags, put back everything you stole. And then you'll see the door. They start taking stuff out. They took everything out. But they still can't see the door. Say, please, let us get out of here. Please, we're sorry. Says, you didn't give everything. No, no, look, the bags are empty. He said, check your pockets. They check their pockets and one of them checks and he finds the golden spoon in his pocket. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot this. And he puts this on a table And literally on the spot, they saw the door. Like any other normal being would see. He says to them, don't steal anymore. This was Baba Sali. The very same Baba Sali, a story was just publicized this week from the people that lived this miracle for the last several decades, where there was a guy, a Jew, from the kibbutz, him, his wife, and his daughter did not keep anything, unfortunately, like many of the people in the kibbutz. And one day, the awful disease arrived at his doorstep, and it hit him, 
like Malach HaMavit. In a very short period of time, he was not only bedridden, but he was on his deathbed in the hospital all types of monitors and tubes and he was dying. The wife is crying, the daughter is crying and then the doctor comes and says to them, today is going to be the last day that your husband is going to be in this world. Say your goodbyes. This is where he was. On his last day, the doctors have given up all hope. There was nothing else that could be due. The organs were failing. And that's it. The wife is crying. The daughter is crying. They're hysterical beyond comprehension. At the same time, a religious Jew passes by them and sees, what's wrong? What do you mean, what's wrong? My husband is going to die today. He says, why don't you go to the tzaddik, the Baba Sali? Ask him for a blessing. He can help you. Baba, who? What are you talking about? No, my husband's going to die. He says, no, no, the Baba Sali. I don't know who Baba Sali is. They don't teach us Baba Sali in the kibbutz. He says, the Baba Zali is a tzaddik. He can help you. No, no, I don't believe in those things. We don't believe in such things. We, somebody told us to keep Shabbat. And you know, we've been keeping Shabbat. We don't do anything. We're just in the hospital. But nothing changed. He says, go to the Baba Zali. He can help you. Initially, they refused. And then this Jew did them a biggest chesed of their life. He says, you know what? I'm going to take you. But he's going to die today. He says, listen, whether he dies or he doesn't die today, there's nothing you can do about it anyway. You're not stopping the death by being here. Let's just go to the Baba Sali and see what he can do. He takes them to Netivot. When they get to Netivot, they get to the Baba Sali's house, they see a line out the door. The woman is crying she knows this is going to be forever. The Gabai sees them. Say, hey, lady, lady, you have to put clothes on. The woman were obnoxiously immodest, literally. Just something like uh, maybe a paper towel would, uh, w- w- was, was like, describing her clothes. She says, lady, you have to put clothes on. No, no clothes. What clothes? I want to talk to the rabbi. My husband is dying. He says, okay, you can talk, but you have to wait like everybody else. But you have, you, rabbi can't see you like this. You have to put clothes on, lady. And she's screaming and yelling. No, what clothes? What is this? Are you going to help me or not? The Baba Sali and his kedusha heard this, heard the screaming. He called over his gabai, he says, Shuada, what is that? What's happening over there? He says, Kfodarav, there's this woman and her daughter screaming and yelling. They want to get a blessing from the rabbi, but they're not tzanua. They're not tzanua, they're not mothers. Bechlala, rabbi, they can't come in here. He says, okay. You turn me around so I can look at the wall. I can't see them. And you bring them in. So, that's what the Gabai did. He brought, he turned the rabbi around. The rabbi was looking at the wall. So he can't see these not modest women. And the women come in. And they start crying and they start telling them how the husband is dying and that today's his last day. And the Baba Sali says to them, You want him to live? She says, yeah, of course, Rabbi. If you go and you take on you and your daughter 100% sniut, 100% modesty right now, I promise you that your husband will not only live, he will walk out of the hospital today perfectly healthy. Is this just a promise? Can anybody 
even imagine such a promise? The doctors are saying he's going to die any minute. The rabbi is saying he's going to walk out of the hospital perfectly healthy. Why? Put some clothes on. The woman says, no, but rabbi, but, but is there something? We keep Shabbat. We started keeping Shabbat. And nothing is happening. He said, no, no, no. If you do what I say, you take on 100% modesty, we have a deal. You and your daughter, no modesty, no deal. Agree or no? We don't have much time. She says, okay, okay, fine, fine, we'll do it. Okay. Go to the market now. You and your daughter, go buy modest clothes and come back here. Mitpachat for your head, cover head to toe. Only thing you see is the face, your hands. That's it. Covered. None of these tight dresses, none of this modest. Now, we don't have much time. The woman and her daughter and their friend took them over there right to the market. They went to the shuk over there, they bought some clothes, they came back fully dressed. Woman from the kibbutz covering our hair. Like a tzaddikah, like Sarai Menu. The daughter is covered like she's been going to Bet Yaakov Seminary her whole life. They're both covered head to toe. They're both tzaddikot, kdoshot. You, wouldn't, you couldn't tell that just, just a, an hour ago they were from the kibbutz walking around like Hashem just created them as babies. Now the Baba Sali says, now I want you to go straight to the hospital. Your husband is waiting for you there. The woman, her daughter, and the same Jewish driver speeding back to the hospital. They're not waiting. They're not taking their time. They're going there as fast as possible. Of course, it took some time. But they got there. As soon as they get to the hospital... Pele Plaut, miracle of miracles, wonder of wonders. They see, she sees her husband, the daughter sees her father sitting on the bed, perfectly healthy, talking to the doctors, and the doctors are all wondering what just happened here. This guy is disconnected from the tubes, he's completely healthy, he's smiling. Initially, the husband couldn't recognize these two women until he realized it's his wife and daughter. He started yelling at them. What are you doing? What is this? I wake up and this is what you wear. You got shmata? You, you look like some old lady? Get this clothes off of you. The woman says, no. No. And she starts crying. Baruch mechaya metim, blessed is the one that resurrects the dead. He says, take it off. Take off this clothes. No, we're going home. She goes, I'm not taking it off. I'm going to stay like this. She goes, why? Why are you doing this? He says, the Baba Sali. The tzaddik told me I have to do this. He goes, who? Baba Sali. He goes, no, we don't follow those things, those fanatics. She says, now we do. He says, no, no, no. I'm going to go talk to him. She goes, okay. Let's go now. Okay. They all go. The husband leaves the hospital. The husband leaves the hospital. The wife, the daughter, the same driver. That Jewish guy had a ride of his life that day. Who doesn't want to miss that? I want to be on that ride. Even though this happened 40 years ago. They're all back in the car. Back to Netivot. The Baba Sali is waiting for them. Apparently, he knew they're coming. As soon as they come in, skipping all the lines, go straight to the rabbi. This time the rabbi doesn't have to look at the wall. But the husband comes in and says, listen, rabbi, you know, listen, I respect you. Thank you very much. But this is not for us. This is not for us. We're from the kibbutz. We didn't grow up this way. We don't keep things. If we go back to the kibbutz, my wife and daughter look like this. Uh, people are going to make fun of us. 
They can make fun of us. This is a problem for me. No, no. You have to cancel. Cancel the deal. Cancel. The Baba Sali says to him, Dear Jew, Yehudi Akar, there's no such thing as me canceling the deal. But you can. You can cancel the deal if you want. But before you decide whether to cancel it or not, why don't you ask your wife what she dreamt about on the way from here to the hospital after she wore the modest clothes she drove to from here to the hospital. It took a while to get there. She fell asleep in the car while the driver was driving. Ask her, what did she dream about? As soon as the wife heard this, she started shaking. Shaking and tears are falling down our cheeks. The husband says, what happened? I, I, I didn't know the dream. What, what, what did you dream? What is this dream? She says to him, the rabbi knows, because he was there in the dream. What dream? I fell asleep in the car, and I was brought up to the Bed Din of Shemaim, the Jewish court of heaven, and they were deciding on your life. And they said, this man is a rasha, wicked, he violates Shabbat, doesn't keep mitzvot. His wife and daughter walk around not modest. No tarat mishpacha. Death penalty. And I was crying. I said, please help me. And then all of a sudden, the Baba Sali came. And he said, Honorable Rabbis, I'm here for this case and I request that we bring this case to the Bed Din of Shlomo HaMelech. The Baba Sali shows up to the Bed Din of Shemaim. They listen. He said, no problem, Kvod Arav. Let us show you the way to the Bed Din of Shlomo HaMelech. They bring him to the Bed Din of Shlomo HaMelech. And the Baba Sali says to Shlomo HaMelech, You said and wrote with Ruach HaKodesh in your book of Mishle, Proverbs, in chapter 31, verse 25. You said that Oz Ve'adar, that the greatest treasure for a woman is her modesty. And if she has this Oz Ve'adar, she has this modesty, then she will laugh on the last day. What is this last day that she's going to laugh on? She's going to laugh that the doctors, those heretic doctors that said, today is your husband's last day. How could it be the last day if this righteous woman is now modest and her daughter is now modest? How could it be that this is the last day? Ah, she will laugh that they said it's the last day because it's not the last day. Shlomo HaMelech says, I accept your chidush and I judge this man l'chaim. To life. And at that moment, you came back to life. Now you decide if you want to live the woman that's your wife, the woman that's your daughter, have to continue being Ozve Adal, has to continue being modest. Because that's the blessing. But if you don't want it, no problem, no modesty. And instead of her laughing, the doctor says it's the last day and it's not, she'll be crying 
because it does become the last day. You choose. The man chose wisely and his wife became a rabbit sin that was as stringent as can be when it came to modesty because she knew that if she even slowed down on modesty a little bit, if the elbow all of a sudden she started showing, if all of a sudden instead of a mitpachat it became some wig longer than the exile, instead of being attractive to her husband, she started becoming attracting to the people in the streets. Her husband's life was on the line. She became one to help other women do tshuva, to understand what judgment is, but to also understand the mercy that's available for those that choose wisely. She sacrificed the kumas. She sacrificed Rabotai Karim de Machoch. She sacrificed the mirror. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu used it to build the Kiyol. HaKadosh Baruch Hu used it to build his house and her home. And he could do the same thing with yours. The question is, what are you willing to sacrifice for Hashem? And even more so, once you've decided to sacrifice something, are you sacrificing sufficiently where you are know for sure that what you're sacrificing is enough to put you on the side of the giver or you're still doing it just for the sake of taking because your primary focus in life is to take, take, take. These things, Rabotai Karim, are real lessons that apply to every single person. Every one of us tends to judge ourselves too harshly or too loosely. Sometimes we think of ourselves as not good enough at all to do anything good, and sometimes we think of ourselves as much better than what we really, we really are. But when we're judging here, it's much simpler. We don't need to look at so many different factors. You look at how you live your life. Are you generally a giver? Are you giving all you got to sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name, to publicize his name? Are you willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of Hashem? Not just in words, but actually, are you doing it in action? If you're doing it, if you're not, you should consider doing it. Why? Because no one ever loses when they sacrifice for the sake of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. In fact, the more you give, the more you end up taking because Hashem gives you so much as a result. With that being said, I hope that every one of us chooses wisely and starts analyzing themselves and where they stand and then moves accordingly. Now you guys can start asking some questions. Be'ezat Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us the answers. If you asked questions on YouTube, I could only see the questions for a second. So you have to ask them again. Same thing with TikTok. If you asked, I have to, you have to ask again. Thank you, David. You enjoy the show. Baruch Hashem. Is there an end of time coming to, of the Mashiach? Um, as far as there's an end of time, sure there's an end of time. Is it the end of time right now? We've been at the end of days already for a long time. We've been at the end of days for a couple of decades already. The end of days is not just a single day. It's a process. Now, as far as the, uh, the process, the sages teach that uh, the Mashiach will come before Shabbat. Now, it doesn't mean the day Shabbat, but rather the year Shabbat. So, David HaMelech teaches us that uh, Hashem uses every thousand years as symbolic for one of His days. So, with the uh, year being 5,784, that means that we are on Friday, 
somewhere around 6 p.m. Uh, right now as we speak. So if the average Shabbat throughout the year uh, begins, let's say at 7 o'clock, 7.30, if you're in different parts of the world, it could be even later, but generally speaking, it's around that 7. That means that we are exactly at that time of before Shabbat. We are at that time of before Shabbat, which means that the Mashiach can show up tomorrow. He can show up in a year from now, in uh, 10 years from now, but needless to say, it's in our lifetime, uh, in assuming everybody has a uh, you know a uh, full lifetime it's uh, it's in our lifetime uh, but the key is to make sure that instead of focusing on when Mashiach comes we have to be more focused on preparing for whenever the Mashiach comes we're already prepared right there and then because the opportunity we have right now is to do tshuva before Mashiach comes because once Mashiach comes it's not going to be the same opportunity as we have right now uh, and that's why it says, and we say it in our prayers throughout the week, that the Goel, the Mashiach, will come to bring salvation to those that used to be pushim, used to be cr- spiritual criminals, used to waste seed, used to walk around not modest, used to be stingy, used to have you know, a lot of time wasted instead of learning Torah. So when people do tshuva, they become part of the people that will get the salvation the Mashiach will bring to the world. But there's also other parts that has to happen, uh, which is there has to be a war. Uh, the war of Gog and Magog, as the prophet Zechariah uh, in chapter 14 and also the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 38 both discuss in detail uh, of this uh, last war. And the last war is not a single war, but rather a series of wars. The war of Gogu Magog is not a single war, but a series of war where the ultimate culmination, our end of that war, is, a, uh, is something that will take, uh, according to the Gomi Vilna, less than 10 minutes. Uh, but uh, the point being is, is that uh, this uh, war of Gogu Magog is going to be a war where two-thirds of the world will die instantly and the other third only part of it will survive. The Mashiach will fight against all of the enemies of Am Yisrael, all of the enemies of the Torah. Some of those enemies will be Gentiles. Some of those enemies will be Jews, uh, which are the Erev Rav. And none of the enemies will survive. They're all going to be annihilated without the uh, Mashiach lifting a weapon, without the Mashiach throwing a bomb, but rather, Beruach Piv Yamit Rasha, with the speech, with the uh, 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 speech that comes out of his mouth, the air that comes out of his mouth, he'll destroy the wicked. So all of the bunkers and the weapons and the bombs and the planes, all of that stuff is, uh, is not tools that are necessary for the Mashiach or necessary for you to save yourself. The way that each and every single person can save themselves uh, for the time of when Mashiach comes and the, and the process of Mashiach arriving is by doing tshuva, spir- spiritually focusing uh, rather than materially focusing, meaning that you have to utilize every tool that you have to serve Hashem and to get yourself closer to Hashem, to do tshuva, uh, to, to be modest, to be uh, 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 somebody that learns Torah, somebody that follows Torah, committed to be honest, to be generous, to, to fix your uh, bad character traits, all of these different things that Torah says, you have to start taking them on and little by little, get yourself into a situation where you're constantly looking for more mitzvot. You know, there's a time where a person uh, has to take big leaps to take on big mitzvot and there are times that a person can take small steps. Now, what's the, uh, what's the difference? When it comes to the prohibitions, meaning things that are forbidden, you have to take big steps. There's no such thing as small steps. There's no such thing as small steps of violating Shabbat. You have to right away take a big step and keep the whole Shabbat and not violate it, at least not knowingly. There's no such thing as small steps of protecting your, uh, your Brit or your modesty. Either you're protecting the Brit and you're modest, or you're not protecting your Brit and you're not modest. Now, of course, there's going to be failures along the way, but at the very least, the effort is 100%. The effort is 100%. So when it comes to the prohibitions, it must be big steps. When it comes to the positive mitzvot of doing things, uh, whether it's giving charity 
or it's a, uh, you know, uh, doing any positive mitzvah, that you could take smaller steps. Uh, you could take smaller steps. But the, uh, the, the negative mitzvot, meaning the prohibitions, that must be big steps. Must be big steps. Stay away from making big sins. Uh, stay away from, from, you know, hurting people, stealing from people, uh, being dishonest, uh, causing people to sin. You know, all of those things, uh, you have to take the big step and do it ASAP. That way you'll be utilizing this time that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is giving us before the Mashiach arrives. And don't harp so much on the timing of Mashiach, whether he's coming now or next week or next year or 10 years from now or five years from now. Don't, because you want as much time as possible because you need to do as much tshuva as possible, learn as much Torah as possible to be the most prepared you possibly can be for when he eventually comes. The people that typically are focused on a specific days of when Mashiach comes are so bent out of shape because of this obsession that they forget about doing tshuva. You know, they, they, uh, they, they forget about doing tshuva in, in some critical parts. So it's more important to focus on the tshuva and not on the date the Mashiach comes. But certainly the Mashiach is uh, coming. Uh, we just have to do as much as we can to prepare for him. And since we don't know whether he's going to come, you know, tomorrow or a year from now or whenever it is, we have to take advantage of whatever time we have to do the best we can. Be'ezot uh, because we could, chas v'shalom, uh, be in that same case as that woman where there was one day to live. And we don't want to have just one day. We need as much time as possible. Uh, is there anything to be excited about Mashiach ben Yosef? Uh, sure. It's, it's part of the... Uh, part of the salvation. It's part of the salvation that uh, the Gemara in Masechet Sukkah says the Mashiach ben Yosef uh, is going to come and he's going to fight against the enemies of Am Yisrael. If we are righteous enough and we pray, uh, he will survive those wars and protect Am Yisrael. If we uh, don't, then Chaz uh, Shalom he could uh, die. So uh, Mashiach ben Yosef is certainly something that's uh, good, it's a blessing, and it's part of the uh, prophecy of the salvation at the end of times. Is there any real Mako, or if, if you make three matches, you have Gan Eden? Uh, I looked into this some time ago. Somebody asked me the same question, and we couldn't find any Mako for it uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, it's not something that uh, really could even guarantee somebody Gan Eden, because if a person violates Shabbat, uh, it doesn't matter what meets what they do, they have no share of the world to come. If a person's an idol worshiper, even if they helped a thousand people, uh, get married. They're still going to gain them forever. So there's the Torah can't promise senseless things uh, like making matches and therefore a person's going to go to heaven. It's uh, it's just not a uh, uh, it's just not it's not something that's uh, a Torah. It's not a mitzvah, it's not a mitzvah that's obligation or anything like that. It's nice if you could help people get married and they're going to live a kosher life together. But if you're making matches between uh, people that are violating the Torah, it's not even a mitzvah. It's actually a sin. Does the Mashiach have to reign for 214 years? No. Talk more about the cash advance. I have at least a half a dozen lectures about the cash advance business. It's a, uh, you know, and a person can watch those lectures as Many sources from the Torah, from the prophets, from the uh, writings, from the Gemara, the oral Torah, the written Torah, from the Zohar uh, that uh, discuss this uh, predatory business and how much uh, damage it's caused Am Yisrael over uh, the centuries. It's always been a uh, thorn in our side as a nation uh, when Jewish people get into the lending business, even though... Uh, 
Uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu uh, prohibited it for, between Jews and Jews and even uh, uh, prohibited it between Jews and non-Jews when it's a, a, a non-Jew that's uh, doing, is favorable to you and it's a non-Jew that uh, uh, you're planning on overcharging. You know, these things are, uh, are, are, are have never been permitted. But unfortunately, people get blind when it comes to money and uh, they, uh, they don't look, they don't look uh, at the right places, they don't learn the right things, and they end up uh, making critical mistakes that not only cause damage to other people, but it causes damage to anyone that's involved in it. Uh, and anyone that is benefiting from the cash advance business uh, is going to end up losing uh, much more than they've ever gained. Much more than they've ever gained. That's why when people t tell me, uh, you know, I've had guys from the cash advance business that have watched my lectures uh, contact me and ask questions and so on. Some of them have actually been nice people uh, that uh, ended up leaving the cash advance business. Some of them are too addicted to it and stayed in, but, you know, they're, uh, uh, they're trying to, uh, to do good things and think hopefully that's going to help them, which it's not. But uh, some of them have really been obnoxious. Either way, some of them, uh, the ones that are in the middle have asked me, Rabbi, so is it, since you're so against the cash advance business, uh, is it okay if I donate to you? And uh, I always tell them, please don't donate a dollar to me. If it's coming from the cash advance business, please don't donate that money to me. Uh, I, I don't want you to donate a single penny to our organization if it's coming from there. If it's coming from something else, you made money in real estate, you made money in the stock market, you made money from a different business that's kosher, no problem. But if you made money from the cash advance business, please do not donate. Don't uh, destroy the kedusha that our organization has with your, uh, uh, with your impure money. We don't want any of it. And all of the people that are benefiting from it, even the ones that are receiving donations from it, knowingly that it's coming from there, uh, and they're not telling people to leave that business, they'll also end up losing. Uh, they're also going to end up losing. It's not, it's not just the wicked people that are making the money by doing this, it's also the people that are benefiting from it. Uh, because sometimes uh, when, when uh, you know, these types of people that are in crooked businesses, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they have like a, a, a conscious uh, 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 that's calling them, telling them to maybe stop, they silence that conscience when they see that the, uh, you know, the, the uh, rabbi... Uh, or other types of uh, leaders within uh, the uh, community are uh, respecting them and accepting uh, their support without saying anything bad about it, they feel like, oh, if it was so bad, they would say something. And since they're not only not saying anything, they're actually you know, encouraging me to donate even more, then they feel like uh, they're not doing anything bad. So that's why they become partners to the crime. They become partners to the crime and eventually they get punished also. And this is going to be a tragedy, but, you know, somebody goes against God, that's what happens. A few of you that are asking for blessings, uh, the blessings need to be complemented with a mitzvah that the person is taking on. If the person is willing to take on Shabbat, willing to take on modesty, willing to take on protecting their brit, then I'm more than happy to bless them. Uh, as Rabbeinu uh, B'moreno Ephraim does, this is the only way that the blessing can have real power for it to be fulfilled. But for me to just give you a blessing without you taking anything on, it's uh, unfortunately insufficient. Is one allowed to lie on their back while they're reading? Uh, if you're talking about a Jew, a Jewish male is not allowed to lie on their back, um, period. Uh, could, bring, could bring a person to sin, uh, intentionally, unintentionally. If you're talking about uh, a, uh, a Jew while they're reading Torah, they shouldn't be lying down at all. Uh, they should be sitting or standing, but if they're tired and, uh, or they're reading something before they're going to sleep, they can lie down, but it, they shouldn't be uh, 
uh, you know, lying down in such a way where it's like a, uh, um, you know, it's, 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 it's inappropriate. They, they could sit down in their bed uh, and, uh, and read, you know, but uh, it's, I've been reading for a long time. I've never really uh, met anybody that can successfully read uh, something meaningful while lying on their back. Uh, it's just not, um, uh, unless, again, that's a position that they already got used to over many years because of sickness and things like that. Tikkun Klali, a tikkun for Zera Levatala. Okay, so I've answered this question many times. Uh, first, I would recommend anyone that is uh, still has, uh, you know, still wasting seed or still hasn't done the tikkunim to watch the film Tikkun Abrit. It's a film that we made. It has uh, over a hundred uh, sources that are that are quoted on the screen and, and shown. Uh, of different things that it's stated about uh, the issues of uh, immorality, wasting seed, and so on. Uh, it's a uh, very, very powerful film that has helped countless people do tshuva for, for this uh, problem. Uh, and, uh, and one of the things that I mentioned in the film towards the end is how do you do tshuva for tikkun abrit? And there are different things that help a person. And one of the things that I explain is that the Rabbi Nachman Mebreslev's Tikkun Klali was never stated as an actual Tikkun for wasting seed. It's not, it doesn't fix the wasted seed that happened the day before or a year before, but rather the Tikkun Klali, which is a series of psalms that a person can and should read, is supposed to inspire the person's heart to do tshuva, for wasting seed. It's not tshuva itself. It's not a uh, repentance itself. It's not a tikkun itself. But rather, it's supposed to inspire a person to do a tikkun, to actually do tshuva for this and stop wasting seed and and uh, and do things that are going to keep them away from it. Uh, but it's not an actual uh, rectification in itself. Uh, whoever thinks that it is is simply incorrect. That's not what Rabbi Nachman Bresla wrote. How do you keep Shabbat the right way? Okay, so the first thing that a person needs to know is that they must learn the laws of Shabbat. Without learning the laws of Shabbat, a person is never going to be able to keep Shabbat the right way. The first thing that a person needs to know is what's forbidden on Shabbat. The main things that are forbidden are the 39 melachot, uh, which is 39 uh, activities that a person is forbidden from doing, such as, uh, you know, you're not allowed to uh, uh, drive, you're not allowed to turn uh, 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 on or off fire, i.e. also electricity. Uh, it, whatever is on, you leave on. Your electricity that's on, you leave on. But also, uh, you're, uh, you're not allowed to cook on Shabbat, you're not allowed to work on Shabbat, like do business. Uh, you know, so there are certain things that a person needs to know as far as what's forbidden and obviously stay away from that. Then there's the things that a person needs to do. So, uh, the, uh, first thing is to prepare for Shabbat, not just on Friday, but also take parts of the preparation for Shabbat throughout the whole week. Don't leave Shabbat preparation for just the last couple of hours before Shabbat. You should do the shopping for Shabbat already earlier uh, part of the week. If you need to buy something last minute, uh, that's fine. But as far as the main shopping should already begin uh, towards the beginning of the week. You should already have some type of a plan of what you're going to eat, where you're going to eat, if you're going to eat home, if you're going to eat somebody else's house. Uh, you know, you should have no uh, uh, stinginess whatsoever when it comes to Shabbat. You should splurge on Shabbat. And the things you buy for Shabbat should be the best. And don't try to save a couple of dollars on uh, one challah over the other. Buy the best challah. Don't try to save money on uh, you know buying this uh, ten dollar wine or uh, versus this uh, you know uh, fifteen dollar wine. 
whatever you spend on Shabbat, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will pay you back. Uh, so be generous on Shabbat. The more generous you are, the more blessing it is. Third thing is, you have to prepare for Shabbat where you have to obviously look the part, wear clothes that you don't wear during the week. You should have a special outfit that you only wear on Shabbat. For women, this is certainly a, a favorite mitzvah for you. You should wear outfits on Shabbat that you don't wear the rest of the week. Not even outfits that you wear to go to weddings or something. Wear sh- just Shabbat uh, uh, outfit uh, that you should have. Uh, same thing for men. There should be a suit that, that you wear, a uh, garment that you wear on Shabbat that you don't wear the rest of the week. Uh, so that's the uh, same thing with shoes. Shoes that you only wear on Shabbat. Uh, you know, if you, if you wear a hat, hat that you only wear on Shabbat. Special clothes just for Shabbat. Uh, of course, preparation be you know hygiene. You take a shower. Uh, you know if a person uh, wants to groom his beard, if he doesn't have a uh, beard or he doesn't grow a beard, then to groom his uh, face, obviously don't shave with a uh, with uh, a razor. That's forbidden according to the Torah. Uh, but the uh, point is, a person should look like a million dollars showing up to Shabbat, uh, fully groomed, uh, fully happy. And also, completely disconnected from work. Completely disconnected. Don't talk about work. Don't think about work. Pretend as if all of your problems have been solved. When you show up to Shabbat, you're showing up as if you're showing up to Gan Eden. Why? Because if you accept the Shabbat in uh, in the right way, the Shabbat accepts you. And you're going to have certain feelings on Shabbat that are unlike the rest of the week. But if you treat Shabbat like it's just a day off from work, you're not going to enjoy Shabbat and you're not going to have those feelings. So it's important for a person to uh, prepare for Shabbat already beforehand. Uh, Same thing with the rest of the house, but also it shouldn't be like high pressure craziness where you know uh, the the husband yells at everybody because they're not ready on time or the mother is yelling at the kids because uh, they're taking too long or she's yelling at her husband because he forgot to buy something no fighting no fighting before Shabbat and certainly no fighting on Shabbat anyone that fights on Shabbat should know they will be turning Genom on for themselves the fire of Genom turns on when somebody's fighting on Shabbat and eventually that fire will be used for that person. person that gets angry on Shabbat, it's considered as if they turned on fire on Shabbat. Do not get angry on Shabbat. Somebody is upsetting you, walk away. If you can't get over it, walk away and don't express your anger with yelling and screaming and, and all that stuff. Absolutely no anger on Shabbat, no fighting on Shabbat. You can't come to terms with somebody, stop talking to them. Stop talking to them unless you can work on yourself and simply not get angry. But either way, no anger on Shabbat. Uh, another thing is, you should always get your, uh, your, your wife uh, something for Shabbat, a flower, or a, uh, you know, maybe uh, something nice. Uh, get your kids also something nice. You know, if, if there's a uh, time to get your kids some type of present, obviously it doesn't have to be expensive stuff. It could be something small. It could be a uh, you know a book it could be whatever it is but something uh, that's uh, uh, certainly related to kedusha but you should give uh, always uh, giving give your wife uh, you know some uh, flowers if she doesn't like flowers then you know buy her some chocolates that she likes or if she doesn't like chocolates she doesn't like flowers then whatever that she does like get her something be some be generous on Shabbat be generous uh, give it to obviously before Shabbat starts same thing with your kids start off the Shabbat with giving. You know, get start off the Shabbat with giving. Uh, you know, we uh, we have a uh, custom Baruch Hashem in our house before Shabbat. If everybody was good, kids get a uh, usually a uh, book before Shabbat. Everybody gets a little book that they have. Uh, uh, they uh, uh, have the chance to uh, read it on, on the Shabbat. Obviously, if they don't finish, they read it. You know, over time. But the point is, that's the time that we utilize to give presents. You know, we uh, even, you know, many people celebrate birthdays. They uh, celebrate the fact that they got older. Not really sure why that's exactly such a celebration. Uh, It's not forbidden to celebrate a birthday, but again, I'm not really sure what is exactly the celebration. But if you're celebrating Shabbat, you're celebrating holidays, Jewish holidays, you're celebrating Rosh Chodesh, you're celebrating days that HaKadosh Baruch Hu decreed as important days, that's okay, now I understand. You use that day to give a present. I understand. 
use that date to celebrate i understand why because you have sages that have discussed this throughout the last several thousand years you're celebrating a birthday and that's the opportunity why are you going to buy your wife something i don't know the only one that celebrated the birthday in the torah is uh so if you are looking to be a giver if you're looking to be closer to hashem you should use shabbat you should use the jewish holidays as opportunities to give meaning your wife doesn't have one birthday she has a birthday every week now you don't have to buy her a diamond ring every week unless you're you know very extremely wealthy but certainly you should be generous certainly you should be generous to your wife to your kids with obviously with tact and with uh with reason uh it's and, and again if if all you buy uh your wife is uh jewelry but you never give her your time you never learn Torah then that that gift will turn into a curse if all you buy your kids is toys uh but you don't really care about whether they're learning Torah and uh whether they prioritize Torah then that blessing that you're giving them will turn into a curse so everything has to be done within reason with a Torah mindset but the point being is is that this is something that if you have the ability to do it do it if you don't have the ability no problem obviously the candle lighting should be a family thing it shouldn't be just your wife going to the corner and uh and nobody knows what's going on nobody really cares everybody's minding their business if you have the opportunity to do it be part of her blessing when she uh, accepts the shabbat of course if you have a good shul in your community you must go to shul go pray after you pray come back home with the two angels that are coming to bring a blessing to the house if the house was prepared like i said then those two angels will both bless your house the good angel will bless your house and the bad angel will say amen but if you didn't do any of the preparation and you showed up to shabbat you know you didn't even have time to take a shower your your, your wife is still wearing our flip-flops she still has a towel on her head she uh barely even uh sure if she turned if she lit the uh shabbat candles on time or was already shabbat then the uh the bad angel will curse and unfortunately the good angel will say amen to that so be uh prepared for shabbat before shabbat before shabbat another thing i would recommend is your primary focus on shabbat is your immediate family meaning your wife and kids your husband and kids don't make shabbat a time to host the whole world especially if it gets in the way of you connecting to your wife or your husband you connecting to your kids i know that people like to have guests but many times guests make a person forget about who is the most important which is his spouse and children spouse and children are priority so if you are uh, you spend more than enough time with your spouse and children throughout the uh, week you want to have guests also no problem but if you don't see your your spouse during the week and this is your time to spend don't bring guests to your house same thing with uh, your your family your mother your father your brothers sisters don't go to your brothers and sisters and your mother every week it's better for you to have some time with just your spouse and kids it's nice to see family but if it's too much it creates problems it creates slumbite problems it creates a uh, a lot of difficulties a lot of difficulties uh i know that some people say no but we go there every week okay you may like it because it's your parents but i bet you your husband doesn't like it or your wife doesn't like it whoever's it's not his family oh no he doesn't say anything yeah he doesn't say anything but he's, he's suffering silently it's not it's not healthy for a relationship for you guys to spend all of the holy days with other people and never alone now again i'm not saying never go but you know you can go once a month uh but certainly a couple of times a month but certainly you should spend some time between the the couple and their children another thing is also is a uh is, uh, make learning torah the top priority of shabbat meaning that you obviously have your family you have a festive meal splurge on the meal eat enjoy but also make sure you have something to say on your shabbat table to your kids don't just be a pig and eat have something to say about Torah that you learned not just something that you learned two minutes before Shabbat started prepare for it during the week have the kids say something if the wife has something to say that's also good but it shouldn't be the wife over everybody else the husband is priority if the wife is the main one that's speaking on Shabbat usually that's a problematic home uh so it's again it's very very important for the husband to teach Shabbat to teach uh, to teach Torah in, in the house also for the kids to be involved don't just make the kids talk and not the parents 
priority is the parents, and then the kids follow. If the kids become the parents, then who's the who's the who's the parents? Then then you know it's, it's just it becomes a mess. A lot of times people have the Dvar Torah only said by the kids. This is not this is not good. Why? Because the kids they're telling you something and they're enjoying it, but they're not getting chinuch. Chinuch is is taught by the parents' teachings. This is the time to do it. Obviously, study Torah with them. Read a book out loud for them to uh, to uh, to hear. Uh, you know, uh, read the parashat together. Uh, read uh, Sipur Tzadikim. Learn Torah together, and of course, you uh, you know, learn Torah alone also. But uh, you know, it's important for a person to spend some time with the family and some time uh, studying on their own, depending on the makeup of the family. Uh, if if uh, if if it's not possible to uh, uh, to be away from the family, then study with the family. But it should never be that Shabbat is only about eating and sleeping. Eating is good, sleeping is good, but studying Torah is critical in order for you to enjoy the Shabbat. Without learning Torah and Shabbat, you're not going to be able to enjoy the Shabbat. It's going to turn into just another day off, almost like a vacation, but not, not, a, not, a, uh, not a spiritual vacation. Uh, another thing that uh, go on, on Shabbat, if there's a shiur in your community, go to the shiur Torah. If it's a good speaker, good rabbi, uh, if you have something to say, uh, you should give a shiur. Uh, it's a, uh, certainly a time to learn Torah, to pray, to eat, to spend time with uh, family. Of course, if you have uh, you know, uh, kids, spend some time with them. Uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of different ways to spend some time. Do not play sports on Shabbat. Don't play sports on Shabbat. Don't exercise on Shabbat. Don't do the things that you can do during the other six days of the week. Don't talk business on Shabbat. You know, there are certain things that are uh, outright forbidden. And there are certain things that may not be forbidden, but they're still not recommended. So there's a a person needs to know that it's not just about keeping Shabbat as far as not uh, lighting fire or, or, but it's also onik Shabbat meaning making the Shabbat holy and enjoyable and glamorous. Shabbat should be your favorite day of the year. That means that every week you're celebrating Shabbat. Uh, the more you celebrate Shabbat, the, the happier you will be as a servant of Hashem, as a Jew, as a person. Uh, as far as if you are going to have guests on Shabbat, it's a, uh, you have to be careful with who you have as guests. You have to be careful with who you have as guests. I understand that people like to invite their friends and uh, you know and, and, and family on uh, you know on Shabbat, and that's nice as long as those people that you're inviting on Shabbat, uh, especially since they're going to be next to your kids, as long as they're not heretics. Don't invite heretics to your house uh, on Shabbat. You want to invite somebody to do kiruv with them, not on Shabbat. Do it on different days. Do it one on one. Why? Because if that person is a heretic, is an idol worshiper, uh, he comes to your house and he starts saying stupid things that are against the Torah that could influence your kids in a negative way. So you have to be very, very careful. You have to be very careful who you invite to your house on Shabbat. Uh, as far as a, uh, uh, prayers, it's best to pray uh, early if possible, but if you can't, pray whenever you can. You know, There's the early minyans, there's the later minyans, but nonetheless, pray throughout the Shabbat. Uh, make sure that you have uh, the uh, three meals uh, during Shabbat. You have the Shabbat on Friday night after you come back from shul. To check what time Shabbat comes in, you have to uh, check uh, you know, your, your local times. There's many applications and websites that will tell you what time Shabbat comes in in your, uh, in your area. Once Shabbat comes in, that's, uh, you know, that's when you're not allowed to do all of the you know, prohibitions of, you know, driving and fire and cooking and so on. Um, you know, as far as uh, heating food, you're allowed to heat food uh, if it's a, uh, a solid food and if it's uh, just heating it but not cooking it. So, for example, soup, if you put the soup on a hot plate, uh, you know, before Shabbat, it's fine. For it to continue heating throughout the Shabbat, but once you take it off as a Sephardi Jew, that's it. You uh, you can't put it back on the hot plate uh, later on or the next day. But if it's a solid food, uh, like most of the time, chulent for most people is a solid is mostly solid, 
or uh, or meat or uh, chicken or any of those foods, those you as long as they're already cooked, you could heat them up, uh, you know, whenever you want. So it's a you have to know the details, and that's why I also recommend for people to learn the laws. There's plenty of books that uh, you can learn the laws from for people that are beginners. For beginners for keeping Shabbat, I recommend children's books. Don't buy adult books as your first book to keep Shabbat. Okay, if you're just starting to keep Shabbat, don't buy uh, adult books to keep Shabbat. Buy children's books that teach how to keep Shabbat. Why? Because the children's books also come with pictures and they come with easier explanations. That's going to help you in the beginning. I understand that uh, uh, some people have too much of an ego and think that it's not good. You're incorrect. It's uh, many times people think that they're keeping Shabbat for 5, 10, 20 years based on what they read in, a, uh, in, in, in the books, but they don't realize that they misunderstood it. And uh, had they actually learned it with a rabbi or someone that knows what they're talking about or even just seen it from a book with a picture, they would know it all along. But many times people are too arrogant to grow spiritually. So... There's no, there's no room for arrogance in, in the servitude of Hashem. Next, a uh, person needs to, uh, after the, you know, there's the Friday night meal, try to leave yourself some uh, room and energy to, to learn uh, later on that night. Obviously, get some rest. Then you pray in the morning. After you pray, uh, you have the uh, uh, second Kiddush with the family. Uh, don't... Uh, uh, don't delay, meaning after you do uh, you pray on Friday, don't spend time at the synagogue to learn before you go home. Go straight home. Go straight home and have the Kiddush right away. On, uh, on, on Saturday morning when you pray, depending on which minyan you uh, prayed, uh, if you prayed at an early Nets minyan, then, uh, and, and you know, no one's waiting for you, then you could learn for a little bit before you go home uh, to do Kiddush. Uh, but if uh, you know the family is waiting for you, don't make them wait. Uh, go straight home, do the kiddush. You want to learn, you learn after you eat. That's the lunch. After that, obviously, you spend some time with the family. You learn a little bit. You want to rest a little bit. You know, if you need it, uh, you can. If you learn a lot of Torah throughout the whole week, then you can use Shabbat as a time that you could also rest more than learn. But if you uh, work most of the week and your main uh, uh, time to learn is on Shabbat, no resting on Shabbat, just studying. Uh, meaning don't take, don't take a two-hour nap on Shabbat if your only time to study Torah is on Shabbat. Uh, you've been sleeping the whole week already. So after you have the second meal, you study, you hang out with the kids, hang out with the wife, hang out with the husband, all that good stuff. Then you have Sudash Lishit. Sudash Lishit should be also a festive meal. But some people have a uh, you know bigger meal some people have smaller meals either way it's good to have uh, bread with every one of the meals every one of the meals you have some bread uh, but uh, don't have just a tiny little bite that's not fulfilling the halacha make sure that you take the right quantity of bread and uh, you eat it uh, after you have the third meal then of course uh, shortly after the third meal then you have the uh, Motzei Shabbat now, Shabbat is still not over, even though you've done Avdalah, uh, and uh, at, the, um, at the synagogue, and then you have to do Avdalah at the house, if you have people at the house. Uh, Shabbat is technically over, as far as the Shabbat, but you still have the part of the Shabbat observance to do after Shabbat, which is Seudah Revit, the fourth meal. The fourth meal is not a suggestion. The fourth meal, you need to have it, and it should be something new. If it's not possible for you to have something new, you can't afford it, uh, you simply don't have, whatever it is, okay, but you have to have a fourth meal. Now, the fourth meal, you don't have to have right after Shabbat. You can have it even two hours, three hours after Shabbat, but you should have a fourth meal, and it should be a new meal. It doesn't have to be uh, you know, a four-course meal. You could have brand new pasta with some sauce. You could have, I don't know, uh, pizza. You could have, uh, I don't know, whatever it is that you like, but it should be new. Shouldn't necessarily be the uh, stuff that you already ate on Shabbat. Uh, that's the fourth meal. Fourth meal is a, uh, also brings a special blessing for a person. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of blessings come as a result of the fourth meal. Uh, this was instituted by David Melech. Either way, now you have... Uh, finished the fourth meal 
And now, it's time for you to already start preparing the next Shabbat. The next Shabbat. So, whether it's shopping, preparing, all that good stuff, every week, every day a little bit of some thoughts, some preparations for Shabbat. If you do that, if you make your priority to learn Torah, to uh, bring Kedusha to your house on Shabbat, your Shabbat will truly be holy. And Bezat Hashem, all of us will have a holy Shabbat. Okay, maybe another one or two questions. And then we're done for the day. Okay, in regards to lights on Shabbat, um, if you are very conscious of your uh, spending and uh, you know and, and the meter of your lights and so on, uh, now first off, obviously we're not allowed to turn on or turn off lights on Shabbat ourselves. But if you're very conscious about spending. Uh, or you're very conscious about you know certain lights being on or off at specific times, then you can get what's called Shabbat timers, which is programming the uh, light to turn on or off uh, at specific times before Shabbat, before Shabbat. But this is specifically for lights. It's not for uh, you know you to turn on and off uh, you know a uh, your car or uh, turn on and off your television. This is for lights. Uh, you can use Shabbat timers for that. Uh, yes, but as long as you program it before Shabbat. Uh, you know, some people uh, are not so uh, conscious on, on these things and they just uh, leave things on or leave things off. And that's how I am. I don't have a Shabbat timer. Uh, I never had a Shabbat timer in any of the houses that I've lived in. Uh, if we want something on, we leave it on. If we want it off, we leave it off. If we forget, we forget. But point is... Uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, so particular about those things. I know some people are. They want their, uh, I don't know, kitchen on at specific times and the dinner area at specific times. Um, I'm not so uh, precise with those things myself. Quite frankly, uh, it, I, it's not something that would fit my lifestyle. Uh, you know, if, if I want to, you know, if, I, if I'm already going to be uh, uh, in my house trying to enjoy myself, I don't want to have any limitations that I could only be in this room at this specific time. You know, so... Uh, if I want something on, I leave it on the whole Shabbat. I want something off, I leave it off. And that's it. But again, you want to be more particular, you want to invest the money and time into getting your Shabbat clocks, there's no problem with it, as long as you know what uh, you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Now, one thing also a person needs to be careful of is uh, sensors that are turned on by movement. Okay, if it turns on or off as a result of time, meaning it reached a specific time and that's why it turns on, that's fine. But if it's turned on by movement, that's a problem. If you have one of these lights in your house or outside of your house, where every time you pass by it, it uh, turns on, you have to turn that thing off or keep it on the whole Shabbat. You have to turn off the sensor. Uh, either that light is on the whole Shabbat or off the whole Shabbat. The sensor is a problem. Uh, now, if you know that your neighbor or somebody else has one of these lights and every time you pass by their house, uh, the light uh, turns on, that's not your problem. It's okay. But if it's your light, then you have to either turn it on or turn it off. Uh, the sensor has to be turned off for Shabbat. Uh, now, as far as the, um, the lights inside your house, again, you have a Shabbat clock. That's not a problem. That's not a problem. Uh, another person is asking, is it an obligation for us to teach the Christians uh, Torah. Uh, no, it's not an obligation for us to teach the Christians Torah. It's an obligation for us to teach the Jews Torah. Now, once we teach all of the Jews Torah, then we uh, will be obligated to also teach the rest of the world. Now, if the uh, non-Jews can learn while we're teaching the Jews, as a you know, then no problem. Meaning, if I give a lecture, certainly... A part of my crowd is Jewish, and part of my crowd is not Jewish. 
There's no problem with that. Why? Because I'm teaching for the Jews to listen. But if a non-Jew wants to come and join us too, no problem, more than welcome to. But I can't make a lecture just for non-Jews. I can't make a lecture just for non-Jews. As a rabbi, I'm not allowed to do that. Now, if a, uh, if a, if a, uh, a Jew understands the laws of teaching Torah, they know that their priority is to teach Jews, not to teach non-Jews. This is the mistake that many of these organizations are making where they prioritize teaching non-Jews Torah, like these Noahide organizations where they have special classes for non-Jews. This is a mistake. It's a mistake. It's actually forbidden uh, according to many of the poskim, uh, which include Rav Avad Yosef, uh, Rav uh, Oyerbach, uh, uh, and, and, and several other chachamim uh, that have spoken extensively about this. Uh, there's no permission to do such a thing. Your obligation is to teach Jews. If the non-Jew shows up, wants to learn, no problem. They, it's, it's their decisions. But it's a, uh, uh, as far as to teach the Christians, uh, again, if the Christian wants to show up online and turn on or play, play on my lecture, I don't have a problem with it. Enjoy. Hopefully they do tshuva, they abandon idolatry, and even convert to Judaism. It's fantastic. Uh, but uh, for me to go make a lecture just for Christians or just for Muslims or just for uh, righteous Noahides uh, is, uh, is, not, is not allowed. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not something that's uh, allowed. In fact, uh, I said this in one lecture about a year or two ago, and one of these uh, so-called uh, Noahide organizations uh, contacted me or they made a uh, uh, public comment uh, that, oh, how could I be saying things? They're a holy organization. How could I be speaking against them? And I told him, because you're, you're, you know, you're, you're doing things that are against the lacha. No, what are you talking about? Show me one chacham that says such a thing. Well, I show them a few. They didn't respond after that because they realized that they're wrong, but if they admit that they're wrong, they have to shut down their organization. Uh, so... Again, it's a, uh, uh, important to a person to know that we have no problem being a light to the nations, but that's after we are a light to ourselves first. Once we, are, we fulfill our obligation to be a light to ourselves, to our, to our own people, then uh, we could also be light to others. And in fact, when the more you are a light to our own nation, the more we become a light to the nations. Okay. My niece is in her thirties and she's seriously looking to get married. She's apprehensive to date men who are divorced. Is this correct? If she's never been married uh, and she's afraid to uh, marry a person that was divorced, uh, I could understand her apprehension, but uh, if the only thing, the only issue with is with the man is that he's divorced, uh, then it's a mistake. If he's a righteous man, he learns Torah, he's a uh, you know, good-hearted person, he's generous, uh, and the only uh, thing that he has, he has a divorce on his uh, record. That doesn't necessarily make him a bad candidate. Uh, but uh, if he has certain baggage she doesn't want, she doesn't want then uh, even if he's not divorced, that she shouldn't uh, go with him. But divorced by itself is not necessarily a, uh, uh, a red flag to stay away from. No. I know some people in my community who do not have mezuzot on their doorposts. Some of them put it behind the door because they seem afraid of anti-Semitism. How can I convince them to get mezuzot? Uh, can they start with putting it in the front door is this enough spiritual protection for the home and the family? Uh, as far as having mezuzot, they have to have mezuzot. If they want to put it on the inside part of their door, uh, but still on the mashkof, uh, there's no problem. They can put it on the inside part of the door. They don't, it doesn't have to be on the outside part of the door. It just needs to be on the mashkof. Uh, but if they don't have it at all, uh, then that's certainly a problem. Uh, can they start by putting uh, one mezuzah instead of putting five or ten mezuzah like they need if they have that many rooms? Sure, they can start with one, but you know it's uh, they certainly need more. Uh, so I mean, it's uh, one is better than zero, 
but it's still not enough. We can't pretend like it's that it, it's fulfilling the obligation. The obligation is to put a mezuzah on every door in your house, aside from places that, uh, like the bathroom or the, the bath or closets, but every door and it requires a mezuzah. Can a Kohen be a doctor? Uh, yes, a Kohen can be a doctor, but they have to be careful when it comes to uh, specific types of medicine. Uh, it's, it's, uh, not all medicine is the same. The Torah describes temple offering as a pleasing fragrance to Hashem. I'm intrigued by the insights behind this. How can an average person understand the concept? Well, they simply have to read what Rashi says. Uh, and Rashi explains the fragrance to Hashem means that they are uh, doing the will of Hashem and it's pleasing to Hashem that his nation is doing his will just like good smell is pleasing to a person. If I make $2,000 from a job and I have to pay my employees, do I give 10% from the 2000 or do I take 10% after I pay my employees? Uh, well, if you... Uh, are uh, an owner of a business, uh, there are certain expenses that are a must, uh, like paying your employees. Uh, but at the same token, if a person pays all of their uh, expenses, then uh, they're not going to be left with anything to give as ma'asir, meaning that after you pay your employees, let's say you made $2,000 of a job, you pay your employees, by the time you finished, uh, you have a, uh, uh, you know, $100 left. So your ma'asir now is going to be $10. Uh, again, it's a uh, it's it's better than nothing, but uh, one of the uh, things that uh, maser helps with is emuna, meaning it's not just the mitzvah of giving, but it's also mitzvah of believing. Ideally, it would be from the gross amount, not the net amount, uh, unless the net amount is significant, meaning you have a very big business. Let's say, for example. A person sold a five hundred thousand dollar piece of real estate, uh, you know, and uh, and out of the five hundred thousand uh, dollars, you know, let's say uh, two hundred thousand dollars is profit. Now, sure, it would be great if he can give uh, Maaser off of the five hundred thousand, but it's not correct. He could still give Maaser off of the two hundred thousand dollar profit because it's still substantial. But uh, if a person gives Maaser only off of his net income, since most people in society, especially Western society, live above their means, uh, there is no net amount. Literally, there's no net amount because people pretty much spend more than what they get. That's the reason why everybody's in debt. Most of the time, it's debt they can't afford to give back. Uh, they, they buy things they don't need. They, uh, they, they're cheap on things they actually do need. And, and it becomes a, uh, a cycle where a person usually never has for the things that are necessary in life, like for the sake of Torah. That's why people are never stingy when it comes to vacation. They're never stingy when it comes to buying, uh, you know, a, a clothes that they want. They're never stingy uh, about, uh, you know, different pleasures of life. Where do they become stingy? They become stingy when it comes to holiness. They're stingy on the price of mezuzahs. They're stingy on the price of tefillin. They're stingy on the price of a talit. They're stingy on the price of donations for, uh, for Torah. They're stingy on the price of books. You know, I had somebody uh, ask me the other day if uh, he can use his maser money uh, to pay for uh, his son's uh, Torah books. His son wants a collection of Torah books, uh, and uh, you know, and he, you know that cost a few thousand dollars. And he asked me if he could use his maaser money for it. Now the answer is simple: that if you're well off, which in this case I believe the person was, because you know it's 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 not a big deal for him to spend several thousand dollars on the books, then really you shouldn't use your maaser money for it. This should just simply be, you know, you fulfilling the mitzvah of educating your son. But if you're not well off, okay, you know, it's, you want to use that, use that. Point is that if a person is making, you know, 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars a month, and uh, instead of writing a check for uh, four or five thousand dollars a month uh, to, to help uh, publicize the Torah, they're trying to, uh, you know, use the tuition for yeshiva, the uh, expense of the Torah books, 
and uh, you know, and uh, a few other uh, um, you know things as their maaser money, you're not gonna really see the same blessing. You're not gonna really see the same blessing. Why? Because it's not just the blessing of that you get from the uh, from the giving. The biggest part of the blessing is also that maaser teaches a person how to believe in Hashem. And know that Hashem is the one that's giving you panasa. Uh, so when a person is constantly looking for ways to, you know, lower their their maser, that means that they're looking at maser like a bill. Maser should not be viewed as a bill. Maser should be viewed as an investment. That's the money that you have. That ten percent or that twenty percent that you give for the sake of Torah, that's really how much you have. Just like the Abarbanel, the Abarbanel was very very wealthy. Was the treasurer for the king of Spain, and then later on, when they were kicked out in the Spanish Inquisition, he became the treasurer for the king of Portugal. He was, Baruch Hashem, destined to be successful uh, monetarily, and obviously he was a giant chacham in Torah, spiritually is the ultimate success. And Abar Benel, uh, one of his haters, went to the king and told him, listen, uh, this guy is uh, stealing from you, your highness, because look how rich he is, he has millions of dollars. So, of course, the king didn't believe it, but he said, let me ask him. So he asked the Babanel, how much money do you have? And the Babanel told him a specific amount. And the king knew that there's no way that it's this amount. It's much more because just the house was worth more than this amount. So he got so angry that he put the Babanel in jail. After a few days, he came to the Babanel. He respected him. He said, how come you lied to me? And told me that you only have uh, let's just say a hundred thousand. When I know that just your house is worth a million, he said, "Your Highness, I didn't lie to you. It's just that your perspective and my perspective are different. You're looking at how much money do I have by viewing the possessions. I'm telling you, the money that I really have is not those possessions. Why? Because look, in one second you took away all those possessions." You thought I lied to you, you put me in jail, you took my house, you took the property, you took the jewel, you took everything. So it's not really mine. If it's mine, no one can take it from me. And therefore I said that the only thing that's mine is the money that I already gave in tzedakah, that I already donated. That's my money. Because no one can take that away from me. And I told you the total amount of money that I've donated. Ah, the king respected him again and said, oh, I didn't know, I should have known, should have had patience. So a person should look at giving ma'asel, giving that 10%, or if they're, uh, you know, if they're willing to even give 20% based on uh, their, uh, their gross. But again, it's, a, uh, it, it's something that you have to look at as a perspective where you look at it that it is an investment, not an expense, not an expense. Sometimes there are certain people that can hear 100 lectures about ma'asel but still not give even 1%. Why? Because they just uh, they have a spirit, spiritual sickness. So the way to solve that problem is by giving a little bit at a time. That's why I recommend everyone that's watching that if you don't, if you did the check that we discussed earlier today about whether you're a giver or a taker, and you find yourself to be a taker, my recommendation is take, let's say, I don't know, fifty dollars, a hundred dollars. Whatever it is that's, uh, you know, that uh, depending on your income. Let's say, uh, I don't know, make, let's take, I don't know, 1% of your income, 5% of your income, whatever it is, and sign up for mo- one, uh, uh, monthly, uh, automatic monthly donations. So let's just say, argument's sake, 100 bucks a month. $100 a month, automatically put it on, go on the website and sign up to give $100 a month. Now, even though this is nowhere near the 10% that you're supposed to give, and definitely not the 20%, and it's not even 5%, and it's probably not even 1%. But at the very least, if you give $100 a month, and it becomes automatic, now even though you're viewing it currently as a bill, because you're earning the mitzvah, and I'm hoping you continue learning Torah with us, little by little, you're going to start liking to give. Little by little, you're going to start liking to give, and before you know it, you're going to want to give more than just $100. But if you're one of those people that says, no, no, I'm not going to give now a little bit at a time. I'm going to wait until I have a lot more. Guess what? You're never going to give. Not only are you not going to give more, you're never going to give, period. Why? Because you're giving the Satan too much room over your heart. Too much control over your heart. So the best thing to do is to start with giving a small amount every month. Some people I recommend, 
they make money regularly, like on, you know, I, I recommend for them to give money every week. Depends on a person. Depends on a person, but either way, a person should have it as an automatic thing. Automatic thing that you're giving, because that is one way that you can uh, fight the Satan that's trying to convince you not to give. Uh, is it, well, thank you for the is short selling foreign currency allowed? Is it allowed according to the Torah? It's allowed. It's not. Uh, it's not a prohibition or anything like that. You just have to be make sure that you know what you're doing. Shorting currency is not, uh, or shorting anything, is uh, is not for the faint of heart. You could lose a whole lot more than you could possibly make, so you have to be careful. Um, How do we explain when a Torah mentions several people that live many more years than the rest of mankind, but we don't accept accounts of others who claim to live in other periods, not corresponding to their historical record? I don't exactly understand the question. As far as if the Torah says that people lived for many hundreds of years, there's no problem with it. The Torah says it. It's true. As far as other people saying that they lived a long life, we don't necessarily reject it. If they say they lived 100 years or 200 years, Fine, let them live 500 years. What do I care? What? There's no prohibition of uh, believing them or not believing them of what they say. I'm not really sure uh, uh, what you're saying here. Uh, could you explain the difference between redemption and salvation? And also, if you get Allah Abba with either. Uh, well, the uh, redemption and salvation can be used synonymously uh, to a certain extent. It's a... Uh, when the uh, Mashiach comes, those that are righteous uh, will be uh, redeemed, meaning they'll be able to see uh, the enemies destroyed uh, and they'll be able to see the blessings being given. Uh, those that are wicked will be destroyed. Uh, in fact, uh, 40 years later, there's the resurrection of the dead uh, where the both the righteous and the wicked will be resurrected. The righteous will be rewarded and the wicked will be punished. And part of their punishment is that they'll be resurrected to see the reward of the righteous and then destroyed again. Uh, now, as far as the, uh, the, uh, the ultimate uh, uh, salvation that uh, the righteous people get, is they, uh, they get, uh, some of them will have the merit to see Mashiach, some of them uh, will, uh, that, uh, you know, will have the merit to be resurrected, some of them will have uh, the uh, merit to uh, you know go and, and live in this world for that last thousand years from the year 6,000 to 7,000 uh, and then there's uh, certainly uh, Olava as far as uh, if one gets this does one get that not necessarily some will get one well not the other so it depends it's a case by case basis but too extensive for uh, for today to go into Do the laws of modesty apply to non-Jewish women too? Uh, not to the same extent as Jews, but certainly a non-Jewish woman should be modest because she could be enticing uh, Jews to sin as a result of her lack of modesty. Is it ethical for a single woman to become pregnant via artificial insemination? Ethical? Uh, it's, it's, why don't she get a husband? It's nothing. It's not a matter of. Uh, it's not. It's not the right way to uh, live a life. You should get. She should find a husband, and get married, and then have a child in a natural way. Why does she uh, uh, want to uh, bring a uh, a child from uh, somebody that wasted seed? Um, it's. It's. Do you know what kind of uh, soul that uh, seed will have? It's. You know. It's a wicked person. It, if you wouldn't even look at him. Uh, in the street, but uh, you're going to take uh, his seed? doesn't make any sense. At the very least, if you find somebody that uh, you want to uh, be with and you want to reproduce, uh, then at the very least, you'll know what, what you're doing. I don't understand why anybody would do such a thing. Question, how do I get Gan Eden when I'm full of sin and how do I sacrifice my life to live with Hashem's path consistent basis? Uh, well, as far as the sins that were made, we do tshuva. Tshuva is first, stopping the sin. Second, making sure that we learn enough 
uh, and do enough life changes to stay away from repeating the sin. Three, saying I'm sorry for the sin, uh, and uh, if tested again to pass the test. So that takes care of all the sins. Uh, and then, of course, it's learning Torah and doing mitzvot. If you occupy yourself with learning Torah and, 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 and doing mitzvot throughout your day, whether your day is the day of an avrech that learns Torah all day, or your day is of a worker that works most of the day, it could still be comprised of mitzvot. Uh, you don't have to be an avrech or rabbi that's learning Torah all day just to, be, to do mitzvot. Every Jew can do mitzvot from morning to night, even if they're working all day. You do business honestly, that's a mitzvah. You tell the truth, that's a mitzvah. You uh, pay your employees on time, that's a mitzvah. You, you, uh, uh, you, know, you, you uh, say a blessing before you eat, that's a mitzvah. You say a blessing after you go to uh, the bathroom, that's a mitzvah. You pray in the morning, that's a mitzvah. You give tzedakah, that's a mitzvah. Uh, you know, you, your whole day can be full of mitzvot. Uh, so it's a, it's, you don't have to be a, uh, a big talmit chacham in order to go to Gan Eden. You could be a righteous Jew. They, uh, that uh, gets Gan Eden. In fact, Mar Ukva. Mar Ukva was a, uh, a person that was a business person. He didn't know much Torah, but he uh, was offered a uh, immorality with some woman, and he passed the test. He didn't do it. He didn't do it, and because of that, he got a big blessing from Hashem that he had a spiritual aura among him that only the righteous people were able to see. Rabbi Akiva saw it, and he asked him, How, who are you, and what are you? And he saw that he's not a Torah scholar, but he's a decent person. And he realized this person is a uh, special neshama that has a lot of potential. He says, come, I'll teach you Torah. Come, I'll teach you Torah. He went, and he started sitting and learning Torah with Rabbi Akiva, and Marukra became not only knowledgeable in Torah, he became one of the greatest sages that we ever had. Why? Because he passed the test. He passed the business test. He passed the morality test. He studied Torah and ultimately became not just uh, uh, knowledgeable, but he became uh, extraordinarily knowledgeable and righteous. So point is, is that a person that just thinks that just a, uh, you know, if, if you're in a Bet Midrash all day, that's the only way you're going to go to Gan Eden, it's not true. There are some people that are in a Bet Midrash but are going to Gan Eden. And there are some people that are in the workforce but are going to Gan Eden. It all depends on how you conduct your day. If you conduct your day where it's full of mitzvot, you're, you're, you're not making uh, any uh, sins uh, intentionally, you're constantly trying to do tshuva, you make time to learn Torah, uh, Torah is your priority in life, even though you have to work, even though you have to uh, uh, you know, uh, struggle in order to make ends meet, but you still make Torah your priority in life, uh, you constantly work on yourself, you pray, uh, you give uh, tzedakah to the right places, uh, you are uh, on the way to Gan Eden. But if a person, uh, you know, thinks that uh, they're, the only way they're going to go to Gan Eden is uh, if they're uh, going to be in a learning Torah 24 hours a day, it's not true. Some people, they, uh, they were brought into this world not to be Torah scholars in uh, learning Torah all day, but rather to help Torah scholars financially because Hashem gave them blessing of a lot of money or the ability to make a lot of money, and it's better for that person to learn a little bit of Torah and work more, rather than learn a lot of Torah then, and work less. Why? Because he has a certain blessing. Chafetz Chaim one time saw uh, that there was a uh, very wealthy man that uh, was a businessman, and uh, he decided that he's going to quit his job and start learning Torah. And uh, because of that, he wasn't making as much money, so he wasn't giving as much tzedakah. And on Yom Kippur, he, uh, you know, when everybody went home and during the uh, break in the middle of the day, you know, taking a break for like an hour, two hours, this uh, businessman that's getting stronger in Torah stayed in the shul and continued reading Tehillim. The Chafetz Chaim came to him and said to him, what are you doing? And he said, I'm reading Tehillim for the Rav. He says, why is that going to help you? He says, for the Rav, I'm reading Tehillim. I'm not uh, sleeping. I'm not. He goes, yeah, but you're... Committing treason anyway. Because me committing treason? How? I'm learning, I'm keeping Shabbat, I'm learning Torah. He says, let me ask you something. Did you go to the army? He said, yes. He says, you fought in the war? He said, yes. He says, so if you fought in the war, and let's say you were uh, one of the uh, soldiers that was in the front lines. 
And uh, you decided that uh, in tomorrow's battle, you're not going to go to the front lines. Instead, you're going to be one of the guys that uh, decides to be a scout to see when the enemy is coming, to help the snipers. Now, if your commander finds this out, is he going to reward you or punish you? Said, of course he's going to punish me. Why is he going to punish you? Said, because I'm not doing my job. He goes, how is he going to punish you? He goes, with such a thing, if I'm doing something against the commander, it's uh, committed as if I uh, helped the enemy. Because me, they depended on me being in the front line. Instead of being in the front line, I went and I did something else that could cause other people to die. And what do they call that in the army, he says? So they call that, it's a, it's a form of treason, Rabbi. But what does that have to do with me? He says, everything. You were brought into the world and HaKadosh Baruch gave you a blessing where well, you're successful in making money. You're successful in making money. You're good at making money. And that way, you were able to help the Torah scholars. You were able to help the poor. But you decided, no, no, I don't want to be a businessman anymore. I'm going to go and learn Torah all day. You're committing treason. Why? Who told you that you're allowed to go learn Torah all day? You can learn Torah. But when you have such success with making money, you learn to off a part of the day and you still continue making that money. But if you are not able to, uh, to, uh, to do that, where you have to abandon your job in order to learn Torah, no, no. You go and you work and you learn less Torah. Why? Because the money that you're making is helping a lot more Torah be learned and a lot more righteous people eat than what you're doing by yourself. And you changing without asking for permission, that's treason. And the guy understood, Chafetz Chaim is not kidding, and of course he did tshuva, and he went back to work after the holiday. So a person needs to know that everybody has a role in the world, but that doesn't mean that anybody has a free ride where they don't learn Torah. Everybody has to learn Torah. The question is how much. But either way, even if a person works mainly and learns Torah less, during a day, they still learn Torah every day, but not, not, uh, they're, not, they're not learning for 10 hours a day. They still need to know that if they used part of the money that they are working for to publicize the Torah, they're giving, let's say, 10% of their income to publicize Torah, then even their job, every minute that they're working, is considered a mitzvah. It's considered as if they learned Torah the whole time. So it's a big deal to support Torah. It's not just, oh, we were just, uh, you know, giving money to, uh, uh, to, to somebody and, you know, they could uh, eat, uh, eat today. No, no. It's publicizing Torah is a big deal. Big deal. Can somebody ask for money for being your chavuta? Uh, why would uh, you pay somebody to be your chavuta? There's plenty of people that uh, would study with you for free. Uh, but unless uh, unless that person that you're asking to be your chavuta is a very busy person or a very big scholar that is uh, lowering himself uh, and taking away from themselves in order to teach you. Uh, but uh, if you're both on the same level, you don't need to pay anybody. Uh, but if uh, you are, in essence, this is somebody that's teaching you, uh, you know, and he could be using that time uh, to make money, then certainly he could charge you money for it because uh, he's teaching you. Uh, but uh, again, it's it depends. It depends. But if it's just two people studying, they're both on the same level, I don't understand why anybody would charge or somebody would pay for such a thing. So it could be that, uh, you know, he may be calling it chavuta as, uh, out of modesty, but in reality, it's not a chavuta. He's really teaching you and therefore, he wants to charge for it. And if he wants to do that, yeah, he has the right to do it. Uh, it's because he has the uh, ability to make money with that time instead of teaching you. So, he can charge. For those with health issues, is it allowed to move quickly on Shabbat for health before eating? Like exercise, but not really. Uh... Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, there's no problem with uh, if it's for health reasons for a person to... Uh, yeah, sure, there's no problem with that. Um, uh, 
I'm reading Birkot Eliyahu, I still don't understand before and after blessings when eating uh, mezanot for uh, dessert after a uh, bread meal. Uh, that's why it's better if you're going to eat mezanot, it's better for you to eat the mezanot after you have not only completed the bread meal, but after you've already said the Birkat mezon. And then after you finish the Birkat mezon, then you do a separate blessing for the mezonot, for the cookie or cake that you want to eat. And when you finish it, if you ate a certain amount, then you do the ending blessing for that mezonot. Don't eat mezonot while you're eating a bread meal. It complicates things uh, a lot more than most people can handle. Uh, okay, I think we're done. Even I have said one question ended up being a little more. David Amelach said, Darkea Darkea Noam, implying that Hashem's intention in giving the Torah is that it should be promulgated uh, among others with sweetness and kindness. Uh, and to be, and to bring them close to Hashem. How do you reconcile with this, your more aggressive approach, which is very, very recent in Chazal, an outlook we have never seen in a Torah world? Well, uh, I'm sorry to tell you uh, that uh, you're not familiar with David Melech, nor are you familiar with Chazal, nor are you familiar with the Torah, if you're saying such a thing. Why? And we'll finish this off with this question. As far as Darkea Darke Noam, it means that you're going to help people as a result of teaching the Torah in a way that is going to be soothing, full of truth, full of uh, uh, an intention for the benefit of others, uh, you know, not uh, pacifying people, not a, uh, you know, not uh, trying to get something out of people, but rather for the sake of helping other people. And, and every person needs to be taught in a certain way. Sometimes there's a person that needs to be taught in a uh, way where you're trying to inspire him to do things by giving him stories of inspiration. Sometimes you have to inspire him by uh, giving him hope. Sometimes you have to inspire him by giving him fear. Sometimes you have to inspire him by giving him uh, love. Different inspiration at different times. That's what Darkea Darkea Noah, meaning that you're always going to have the primary intention of helping people be inspired. Now, as far as uh, saying that you only can inspire people by saying uh, that they're all good and they're all righteous and they're all uh, uh, wonderful no matter what they do. This is not the way of Torah. This is not the way of David the Melech. This is not the way of Chazal. And anyone that says so is simply clueless. With all due respect to you that you are unfortunately been uh, misteaching or mistaught, uh, but I can prove it to you. Number one, when you first start learning Torah, what's the first parasha? Parashat Bereshit. Parashat Bereshit tells us that Adam Rishon got everything you could possibly imagine, but he still sinned and he got punished. He got punished. He got kicked out of the uh, of the uh, Gan Eden, right? And at uh, uh, at that time that he got kicked out of Gan Eden, Hakadosh Baruch Hu says, "I'm going to keep him out of Gan Eden. How? I'm going to keep him out of Gan Eden. I'm going to put the chuvim, the cherubs, at the Gan Eden." But yet, these same cherubs we learn about in this week's parasha. So we learn about the cherubs in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 24, that they are destructive angels. If Adam Rishon or anybody comes close to Gan Eden, they'll be killed right away. But we also learn about the cherubs in this week's parasha, where there's these beautiful baby-looking things that are angels that are able to move, that look at Am Yisrael once a year when they open the uh, parochet and of the Kodesh Kodeshim, Gemara Masechet Yoma. All of Am Yisrael looks at it. If the angels of the Kruvim are looking at them, that's favorable. If they're looking away, it's unfavorable. In so many words, the same cherubs are cute little babies, but are an indication of where we stand. We also said they're destructive angels. Why? Because this and this is needed. That's why the second parasha, after we go into this whole thing of first parasha, second parasha, destruction of the world. 
How do you teach destruction of the world in a nice way? Oh yeah, they were really nice people. They didn't mean to sin. So Hashem killed all of them. That is turning Hashem into a monster. No. What we say in the Torah? They were Rashaim. There was uh, Hamas. There were Hamas, not just like the nation, the people of Hamas today, but Hamas in those times. People that were stealing, people that were committing homosexuality, people that were committing all types of immorality. That's why Hashem destroyed them. Fast forward, Sodom and Gomorrah, time of Avraham Avinu. What were they? Sodom and Gomorrah, destroyed. What do you teach them? No, Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, they didn't mean to. They, they, they meant well. Hashem loves them. No, He hated them. That's why He destroyed them. Fast forward, Egypt. Egypt killed us every single day. 150 babies in the morning, 150 babies at night. When Hashem loved them? No, He hated them. That's why He destroyed them. All of the wicked people from the time of Noah reincarnated into Sodom, reincarnated into, into Egypt. Hashem hated all of them. And in fact, He also punished all of the Jews that didn't want to accept the Torah. And He killed over 80% of the Jews in Egypt. They never made it to Mount Sinai. So what do you tell them? Oh no, they didn't mean to. Uh, Hashem loves everybody. No, He punished them by killing them because they didn't want to accept the Torah. So what we see here is that Hashem is constantly killing who he calls his enemies, which includes Jews. We also hear in the Torah that Hashem says, in this week's parasha, a Jew that violates Shabbat gets death penalty. So what are you going to say? Oh, you know, if you drive on Shabbat, Hashem loves you anyway, it's okay. No, he doesn't. He said he'll kill you. Yeah, but he didn't really mean it. Oh, so Hashem is a liar? No, he said it. He's going to do it. Same thing if you look at parashat Bechukotai where HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us a series of four dozen curses that happen to people that go against the Torah. Four dozen curses. And if that's not enough, you go to Parashat Kitavo, where you have eight dozen curses. Eight dozen curses. Almost a hundred curses for people that do not observe Shabbat, people that we see, people that uh, you know uh, go against God in the mitzvot. They don't follow the Torah. Will Hashem lie? He changed the Torah. He, he meant it over there, but he didn't mean over here. No, Hashem wants you to know there's reward and punishment. That's why if you look at the Rambam, Sefer HaMitzvot, Sefer HaMitzvot, Sefer HaMitzvot, Sefer HaMitzvot, Mitzvah number three. Mitzvah number three, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, one of the most important mitzvot for you, my dear friend, to know. Because this is going to help you understand how wrong what you said is. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not, did not say this for no reason. The Rambam mitzvah number three. We'll get there. Hold tight. This Baruch Hashem is... Ah. Rambam. You know Rambam? You know more than the Rambam? Your rabbi know more than the Rambam? No. Okay, I don't know more than the Rambam either. Rambam knows more than all of us. Right? So let's see what the, does the Rambam say. It's mitzvah number three. Mitzvah number three in the Torah. Mitzvah number three is to love Hashem. Mitzvah number three is to love Hashem. Now you would think, oh, to love Hashem, that's proving my point. No, 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 no. Mitzvah number three is to love Hashem. That means removing, removing our own desires, reflect on ourselves to do tshuva so how does this teach fear it doesn't teach fear you go to mitzvah number four for that mitzvah number four says fourth commandment fourth mitzvah rambam sefer mitzvot the fourth positive commandment is that which he has commanded us to believe in awe-inspiring nature of the exalted one and to fear him. This includes 
not to be like the heretics who do as they wish without regards for the consequences of their actions, but rather to fear to bless one's punishment at any moment. This is what the exalted God said in the Torah, fear the Lord your God. This is in verse uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 13. Easy to remember, 613. And that's why in the Talmud, Masechet Sanhedrin says the Rambam, page 56a, the sages discuss, which will answer your sage claim, the sages discuss the intent of the word nokev, in the verse in Leviticus 24, 16, where it says, And he who blasphemes, who nokev, the name of the Lord, shall surely be put to death. Perhaps nokev denotes simply mentioning his name in vain, as implied by a different verse, where it says, who were uh, mentioned uh, nikuv by name. And if you would ask where the warning against mentioning God's name, such as the Torah now is saying the punishment, that this would, uh, would be from the, uh, from the verse, Fear your Lord your God. The Rambam explains that, in other words, perhaps the verse refers simply to mentioning the name of God without blaspheming it. And if you ask what sin uh, uh, this was, the answer would be that one is thereby annulled the commandment of fearing Hashem by complying with the command to uh, to not mention his name in vain. So in so many words, what the Rambam is saying here, or what the Talmud is saying here, says the Rambam, is that this argument is completely incorrect. This argument is completely incorrect, but rather, what is it? He's rejecting the argument, he's saying, for one thing, in order to transgress the, pro- the prohibition of nokev, we need what is referred to in Jewish law as name with name. And this does not occur when one simply mentions his name without blaspheming it. And therefore, it's necessary for invoking the death penalty that one blasphemes God's name with his name. Like saying, let Yossi smite Yossi. And furthermore, the command to fear is a warning through a positive commandment. And a warning through a positive commandment is not considered a warning. Rather, you can posit that fear the Lord your God as a, as a warning, as a, as a positive commandment in itself. And a positive commandment is not employable as a warning. And therefore, conclusion is, fearing Hashem is a positive commandment. In so many words, the Rambam is explaining why fearing Hashem is a commandment and not just a suggestion or as a something that uh, you can choose to do or not to do. In so many words, the Rambam is giving the details of why every one of the mitzvot is what it is. Point being is that there is multiple mitzvot in the Torah, that are to fear Hashem. And not just fear is awe, but fear punishment. Fear mamash, genom. That's what the Baal Shem Tov uh, and his Talmidim, uh, Rabbi Elimelech Milzhinsk, Rabbi Zusha, and many of the Chachamim that followed Chasidut taught that fearing a Kadosh Baruch Hu is not just fearing his awe and his majesty, but to actually fear Gehenim, to actually fear punishment. Now, if a person looks at the five books of Moses, they'll quickly see that this is clear, as Hashem shows punishment in every single parasha in the Torah. He talks about punishment. So if he didn't want you to be afraid of him, why is he mentioning punishment? That's why at Mount Sinai, when Am Yisrael was afraid to continue hearing God's voice, Moshe Rabbeinu tells Am Yisrael, Hashem is scaring you so you don't sin. Meaning, Hashem is intentionally scaring you so you don't sin. The Gemara in Masechet Brachot, says, why is there thunder? Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu create thunder? To create lightning, you could rationalize it in a million ways. But to create thunder just makes a bunch of noise. Why create thunder? Gemara says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created thunder in order to straighten out our hearts. 
Meaning, in order to scare us and realize that we are under the control of God. And if we continue going against God, He'll punish us. Furthermore, if you say that the Torah says that no punishment or it should be only lovey-dovey, you have to wipe out every parasha in the Torah. Now if you say that David the Melech, also lovey-dovey Torah and only everybody is righteous, then explain to me the Tehilim that every Jew reads, not only every day, but specifically every Wednesday. Where the Te'ilim starts, El Nekamot Hashem, El Nekamot Ophia. What is El Nekamot Hashem, El Nekamot Ophia? God is the God of vengeance. The God of vengeance has arrived. This Te'ilim that David Melech wrote talks about the wrath of God and the punishment that he gives the wicked. So you have said, Lashon Ara against David HaMelech, the sages, in the Gemara, Masechet Shabbat, page 54, 55, 56, talk about the different horrendous punishments that Jews get for not rebuking the public, for not rebuking their fellow Jews, to the extent that they say that the reason why Kadosh Baruch destroyed the Bet HaMikdash is because the Jews were not rebuking. Gemara, Masechet Chagiga, page 12, says the Jer- Jeremiah the prophet asked the Kadosh Baruch Hu not to destroy the Bet Mikdash. A Kadosh Baruch Hu that spoke to Jeremiah because he was a prophet says to him, If you could go and find me one synagogue, one synagogue where the rabbi is speaking and rebuking his people, I won't, pun- I won't destroy the Bet Mikdash. Jeremiah went from Keilah to Keilah. From place to place to find at least one rabbi that's rebuking the people. He couldn't find one. And he cried to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, said, I can't find one. Hashem says, then the decree is final. I'm destroying the Bet HaMikdash. And then Jeremiah cried in Sefer Echa that he wrote. And we say this in our prayers on Mondays and Thursdays. Anshe Munavadu. There's no more men of faith. What's in Shem Avadu? It's not a people that don't have Emunah and Hashem that's going to help them. No. People that have faith in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and His Emet and His Torah that are going to stand up for it and teach people the truth. So you spoke and said the t- sages don't teach it. Now you're going to say, oh, Aaron Kohen. Aaron Kohen loved everybody. Mishnah, Masechet Avot, says in the name of Aaron Kohen, Aaron Oev Shalom. Rodef Shalom, he loves peace. He chases peace. Umekarvam la Torah. And he brings people to the Torah. What does it mean he brings people to the Torah? He loves peace. He chases peace. But he brings people up to the Torah. He doesn't bring the Torah down to them. To say that you're not allowed to teach people about reward and punishment is in essence speaking against Aaron Akoin. Moshe Rabbeinu. Gemara. Masechet Megillah. Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to continue living. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, No, I have to take your neshama. Tana Deve Eliyahu talks about it and also Avot Rabbi Natan talks about the dialogue between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Moshe Rabbeinu. Where Moshe Rabbeinu has perfected his body to the extent that it was in the same level as neshama. Avot Rabbi Natan, Avot Rabbi Natan says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to convince Moshe Rabbeinu to leave this world. Convince him. Like a husband convinced a wife. A wife convinced a husband. But after he convinced him, he took his neshama out. The Gemara Masechet Megillah says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu cried, HaKadosh Baruch Hu cried. And he says, who's going to rebuke my people like Moshe Rabbeinu? Who's going to yell at my people and tell them to do tshuva? Who? Who's going to do it? Zohar HaKadosh brings Yeshua Benun. Yeshua Benun. Yelled at Am Yisrael. Why are you going against Hashem? Scared them. Said you're going to go to Gehenom. HaKadosh Baruch came to Yeshua Benun. Yeshua Benun was a prophet after Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeshua, why are you scaring my people? Yeshua Benun says to Hashem, You know, I didn't scare them for the sake of my honor or the honor of my father. I scared them for your honor. So they don't go against the Torah. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Zohar HaKadosh says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu 
kissed the hands of Yeshua ben Nun. Thank you for scaring my people because your intention was to help them do tshuva. Thank you. So now you have Avraham Avinu. Zohar Kadosh, Parashat Re'eh. Says people used to come to Avraham Avinu. Everybody knows Avraham Avinu had openings, four corners, guests. He wanted to convince them to abandon idolatry. Give him food. That's what everybody knows. What everybody doesn't know, Zohar Kadosh says, Parashat Re'eh. How did Avraham Avinu convince him to do tshuva? How? What do you tell him? Hashem is going to give you a reward? He likes you? He'll give you money? No. Avraham Avinu will teach them about Gehenom. If you continue with idol worship, you'll be in this chamber. If you continue with the prostitute, you'll be in that chamber. If you continue doing this, you'll be in that chamber. He would tell them the details of Gehenom. Avraham Avinu made millions of people do tshuva by teaching about Gehenom. Moshe Rabbeinu left Egypt. Between leaving Egypt, getting to Mount Sinai, 50 days. What do you do for 50 days? Zohar Kadosh says, Moshe Rabbeinu taught them Torah. What Torah did he teach them? Didn't he get the Torah yet? Moshe Rabbeinu taught them about Gehenom. Told them, you continue sinning, Akadosh Baruch Hu will put you in different chambers in Gehenom. Gemara, Masechet, Shabbat. Last Perik, believe it's page 154b. Says, person that goes against the Kadosh Baruch Hu can learn from David HaMelech. Why? David HaMelech said in the book of Shmuel, Sefer Shmuel, that if certain people go against Hashem, they go to Kafakela. What's Kafakela? That's when somebody's so bad, they don't even have the merit to go to Gehenom. They go to Kafakela for an extra sentence over there. The Arizal says, could be a thousand years, could be a million years. Kafakela. What's Kafakela? Gemara Masechet Shabbat says, it's when there's angels of destruction fling the neshama from one end of the earth to the other end of the world and destroy it and beat it the whole time. Rabbi Akiva saw one of these people one time. Asked them what's happening to you. He told them what's happening to him. Rabbi Akiva was able to help that neshama. Rabbi Yudaftaya, Sefer Minchot Yehuda, talks about how he spoke to people that are in Kafakela. They told them what's happening to them while they're speaking to him. How they're being literally destroyed in ways that are beyond your comprehension. Was Rabbi Yudaftai a liar? Was Moshe Rabbeinu a liar? Avraham Avinu a liar? Zohar Kadosh is a liar? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is a liar? Rabbi Akiva is a liar? Akadosh Baruch is a liar? Everybody's a liar except you! Everybody's a liar except your the Erev Rav that told you there's no fear! Fear is a commandment from the Torah. Commandment from the Torah. If you don't fear HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're going to sin. You're going to go against HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What's fear against HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Fear of punishment. Fear of punishment. What's fear of punishment? Punishment that you're going to go to Gehenom. Punishment you can go to Kafakela. Punishment that you get sick and die. Punishment that's much further than you can possibly comprehend. Punishment that makes the Holocaust look like kindergarten. To teach people about punishment is absolutely necessary. So to say, Darke Torah, Darke Noam, where you can't teach people about punishment and you love Davi, everybody, that's not Torah, Habibi. Not from David Amelech and not from anybody in Judaism. Not from anybody in Judaism. As far as Chazal, Chazal has extensive sections of the Gemara to discuss different types of punishment. Gemara, Masechet Sanhedrin, Perek Chelek, has details of punishment, of death penalties. Which one, there's a debate between the Chachamim, which death penalty is the worst one? Do you know that? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai argues against Rabbi Yehuda, which death penalty is the worst one? Which one hurts the most? There's no respectfully disagree. There's no disagree. You're wrong. Your rabbi's wrong. You're clueless. Our Torah is real. Our Torah doesn't change. Our Torah is no machloket here. You look at the Chachamim, that's what they say. This entire section, the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, talks about which punishment is worse. Which one hurts more. 
There's a Gemara Masechet Makot. You know what Makot is? Makot is whipping. Why? For sins. There are entire sections of the Torah that talk about punishment. Why? Because punishment is necessary in order for God to be good and just. And that's why the Ramban, Nachmanides, in Sef in Shara Gmul, says in section 7, anyone that says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu's sentence of punishment is limited to 12 months, is a Rasha, because they have turned God into an evil God that punishes everyone the same. No such thing. The Arizal, in Shara Gilgulim, talks about different sentences of reincarnations. All of them are different forms of punishment. All of them are different forms of punishment. Gemara Masechet Psachim, first Perek, says, Rabbi Yochanan, when he would teach, you teach him about punishment. You teach him about reward and punishment. Everybody would come. They would do tshuva. But then there was not enough room. So you got a bigger space. There was not enough room. You got a different space. Not enough room. They had to give him a section outside of the Bet HaMikdash. Outside. Why? There's not enough space. So many tens of thousands of people showed up. To what? To hear about Gehenom. To hear about punishment. What do you think? Rabbi Rabban Yochanan came and told him, Hashem loves you no matter what. Love you, Davi. Hashem needs you. No. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is emet. And that's why every infant that starts to learn Torah, every child that starts to learn Torah, every adult that starts to learn Torah, learns about reward and punishment right off the bat. How? Adam Elishon sinned, he got punished. Kind sinned, he got punished. The generation of Noah sinned, they got punished. Not to say, oh, but maybe you can say punishment, but not the way you say it, Rabbi. Not the way that I say it. Do you know any of the strong speakers of the people that changed Am Yisrael throughout the generations? Go look. Who are the ones that built communities? Like Rav Nisim Yagen, Allah Shalom. Like Rav Shalom Shvadron, Allah Shalom. Like the Ben Ishchai, Allah va Shalom. Like Rav Ovadi Yosef, Allah va Shalom. Like Rav Elazar Shach, Allah va Shalom. Great Chachamim spoke in such a voice at times, make me look like a little puppy. Why? Because when you care, you express that you care. You care about yourself so you are not going to do what I do how do I know you care about yourself because all you care about is to express the opinion that's wrong in order to bring a point out that you think is correct now if you were to measure what you do versus what I do for Klal Israel, you would not make such a comment why because what you do is you take care of yourself, perhaps you donate to one or two people, and that's it. I donate my whole life. I don't need to know what you do, but I can assure you that you and your rabbi would not survive one day in my life. Why? Because I donate my whole life to Klal Israel. My whole life. And it's not a matter of arrogance. It's not a matter of, I'm better than you. It's a matter of, what do the receipts say? Who's doing what? When you wake up in the morning, what do you do? You go take care of yourself. When you go to sleep, what do you think about? You think about yourself. When you live during the day, what do you do? You think about yourself. All of the things that you do is for you. Am I making money out of this lecture? No. Am I making money out of any of this? No. No. So, to go and tell me how to help Am Yisrael, 
At the very least, since you're not willing to sacrifice what I sacrifice, you have to show me your receipts. What are your results? How many people have you changed this week, this month, this lifetime to go and abandon their wicked ways and come back to Hashem? To stop going against Hashem? How many people did you help? One, two, five. Once we spoke to a rabbi in Canada. About five, you say. Five you helped? Habibi, what you do in a lifetime, I've done in a day. And yes, it is a competition. Why? Because you say your way is better. If your way is better, go! Do it! Why are you wasting your time talking to me? Why are you wasting time talking to me? Go help Am Yisrael. Stop talking to me. Go help Am Yisrael. Right now you have thousands of people watching my shoe online and every single one of them is making a comment of how this shoe is affecting their life. People have transformed their life. Some have even changed their religion in order to come back to HaKadosh Baruch as a result of the shurim that they watch. So if you're going to say that there's a better way, show me someone that has better results than me. Show me one. You show me one? If it fits, I'll publicize him. If it fits for me to do it, I'll do it myself. But I can assure you, I follow in the footsteps of my Rav, who follows in the footsteps of his Rabbanim, who follow in the footsteps of all of the great sages throughout all of history and Tomo Moshe Rabbeinu. This is how the Magid Miduvna spoke. This is how the greatest speakers of Am Yisrael spoke. Go read some of the books of the Magid Miduvna. Not just what he wrote, but books that were written about him and how he was spoke. Go read about Arab Shalom Shvadron. Not just about what he wrote, but how people spoke about him and how he lived his life. Go read about Arab Nisim Yagin. Go read about all of these great sages. How they spoke to Am Yisrael. Go read about Moshe Rabbeinu. Find me one. Find me one great tzaddik that actually changed the masses by speaking like the people that you think are doing better. Because we spoke to some of those people that you think are doing better. And when they told me their numbers, my colleague who was friends with them said, how long are you doing Kiruv, Rabbi? And the rabbi over there said he was doing Kiruv for 25 years. He says, how many people have you helped do tshuva in those 25 years? He said proudly, 10 people, maybe even 11. He said, Rabbi, it's good. 10 people have changed their life. But if you look at the results that this aggressive Yaron Reuven is doing following in the footsteps of the greatest Chachamim in history he gets more in a week than you've done in 25 years oh how can I help now so Habibi if you want to criticize me personally I'm too ugly, I'm too fat, I'm too loud, I'm too obnoxious, I'm too this, I'm too that, I care less. Say what you want. But if you want to criticize the Torah, the Vida Melech, the sages, and say that they did something that's the opposite of what they actually did, or that what they did is wrong and no longer applicable to our generation, then I have to speak up. Why? I have to prove for the sake of the public that what you're saying is wrong. I don't know who you are or what you do and any, any of the results that you've gotten. All I know is a few things that you wrote here, some of them that I read, but I can tell you that you have been misled. Misled about how to help people change their life. Misled about the sages. Misled about the Torah. Misled of how to teach Torah. 
misled about how we teach and what the results are. If you want to see some of the results, you could either follow the lectures, you could watch the podcast of people speaking for themselves, you could watch the letters and the comments that are made. You can see the results instead of take my word for it. But either way, before you speak in the name of David Melech or the sages or the Torah, at the very least, do yourself the service and learn it first. Don't just assume that Darke Torah, Darke Noam is what the local rabbi said in the drasha to make you feel good is really the pshat. Because it's not. There's a lot more to the Torah than just teaching nice things. The Torah is reward and punishment. It can't just be reward. It can't just be punishment. If you just reward your wife, eventually she'll leave you. If you just punish your wife, eventually she'll leave you. How do you get her to stay? Reward and punishment. Same thing with your kids. Same thing with yourself. Same thing with employees. It comes together. Reward and punishment is necessary. Now if a person doesn't connect to me or the way that I speak, it doesn't make much of a difference to me. I'm not looking for fans or likes. But the moment that a person says that what we're saying is wrong, that's a different story because that has nothing to do with me. That has nothing to do with me. That's what the Chachamim have been teaching for generations. And if the Chachamim said it, it is right. Not it must be right, it is right. Why? Because these and these are the words of the living God. So if you want to look at what the Chachamim have done and what I've said, I suggest you educate yourself. Not from people, from books. Go read the books. Read. Magid Miduvna. Read. Rav Shvalom Badron. Read. Rav uh, Avigdor Miller. Read any of the great Chachamim from any part of Am Yisrael. Doesn't matter where. Hasidut, Sephardi, Ashkenazi. Read about the leaders. Read about how they lived their life and how they delivered the message. Surely everybody's righteous, everybody's good, but as far as how they delivered the message, how did they get people to change? How did they get people inspired? And you'll see that in fact, the message is exactly the same as what we're doing here. No different. In fact... If I was really being honest with you, I have to pick it up a notch and be even more than what I'm doing now. So Be'ezrat Hashem, you'll see this by seeing the lectures. You'll see this by reading the books. And you'll see exactly. Because those that spoke, spoke like this. Those that wrote, wrote even more than this. And Be'ezrat Hashem, we will continue to be able to follow in their footsteps. Thank you very much for learning with me. May HaKadosh Baruch bless each and every single one of you, including the ones that want to disagree. The whole purpose of the answer was not to go against any one particular person per se, but rather to defend the honor of the Torah for what it is. It has nothing to do with me. Like me or dislike me does not make much of a difference. The key is to know what the Torah says and not necessarily what your own Reuven says. Whether your own Reuven lives or dies, Torah stays the same. The way the Torah has been transmitted from generation to generation is exactly like we're doing it. Somebody wants to do something else, by all means, everybody has a right to do something else, different shita, different things, whatever works for you, as long as it works. But don't think for a moment that your way is necessarily the way of the sages. You have to look at what the sages did. And you'll see. The more you learn about the sages, the more you learn about David the Melech, the more you learn about Moshe Rabbeinu, the more you learn about the greatest people that ever led Am Yisrael, the more you'll see, wow, I guess it wasn't so different than what he's saying. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen v'Amen.
Eliezer ben Holkanos asked him, what can we do to protect ourselves from Chavre Mashiach? He says, Torah and Gilut Chasadim. Even if somebody does a, a nice thing or learns a lot or anything like that, it's never compared to bringing one of Hashem's lost kids that's been lost for the last 3,000 years back home. One of the beautiful things that we have in our organization is that we have both Torah and Zikri Arabim because we have our Kolels, we have our Avrachim, and we also have our Kiruv that we do around the world. Our lectures reach every corner of the world, Baruch Hashem, in multiple languages, but of course, we always want to do even more. כל שעכשיו אנחנו נשמע את השופעה של המשיח. נמצא איתנו כאן האורח מפלורידה, יושב ראש הארגון, מזכה הרבים, הרב ירון ראובן. בעזרת השם כולנו נעשה ונצליח ונגדל בתורה ונזכה את הרבים ונעשה כבוד שמיים כמו שצריך. עבדתם המלאי התורה, תמשיכו, תהיו אור גדול. שמה ישראל, אדוני אלוהים, אדוני... בהזדמנות אני אברך את הרב ירון ראובן שהוא זקן את הרבים ומחזיק תורה בעם ישראל בארץ ולגלתי בתפוצות אשרי אמר שלך לקרוא שימשיך עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה זכות גדולה מאוד שהוא מחזיק תורה בעם ישראל טוב שסים נוספו הערב לעם ישראל לכבודה של תורה להרמת קרנה של תורה וכל הדברים הללו ברוך השם הודות לידידנו יושב ראש הארגון שעוד לא ידע את ההפתעה שתכננתי לו while we have Kiruv work that we've done throughout the whole year, we also have the Torah that we're constantly producing more and more of, and last but not least, the uh, Chesed to feed the poor people in Israel. A very special thank you to all our amazing guests who show real about this land by taking the time out of their busy schedule and sharing their ups and downs with us, all for the sake of our land. Yirgun Be'ezrat Hashem Olech Lechalek Me'ot Salei Mazon one of the big things that we have, aside from this campaign, you probably see this poster or something similar to it, is also we published some of the recent results that we have, or at least up to now, of the organization. And one of the reasons why we do this each year is because we want to make sure that our partners, our donors, our Talmidim, know where their money is going. Unlike everybody else that, you know, uh, says a lot, does a lot, we want to show you what these results are. I can tell you from my experience and a little bit of knowledge about the whole Torah world, I don't know of anybody else, uh, any other organization on planet Earth that produces dollar for dollar what we've produced over these last few years. This is nothing to be arrogant about. It's simply Siyat Bishmaya Kadosh who helped us. We made every sacrifice that we can possibly make in order to, to make it happen. Producing nearly 300 films, publishing 32 books, our own books, giving out 154,000 books for free. Giving out 154,000 books is not a cheap endeavor. Anyone that wants to do such a thing has to be completely committed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to his children, and most importantly, to have bitachon in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his Torah. We also have fed over 160,000 people over these last several years. Each year during Pesach, the high holidays, throughout the year, we help a lot of people eat, help make sure that they have groceries, food, all types of things. And uh, you guys have seen many of the videos that are uh, that we've produced over the years to actually show you the people that are getting this food. You have here 160,000 people have eaten, nearly 300 Torah films. And then on top of all of it, we have 1.4 million USB CDs and cars that have been giving out for free. All of the work that we've done over the last 10 years on these USBs given out for free. Last but not least, 12,000 video and audio lectures available online in about 14 different languages for the world to watch for free. <laughs> ארגון בעזרת השם לקח על עצמו את אחת המטרות הקשות ביותר בדור שלנו לתקן עולם במלכות שדי לא להסתפק במשהו אחד לעזור רק לאנשים מסכנים רק לאנשים ניצולי שואה רק לאנשים שלא מכירים את אלוקים רק לאנשים שאין להם כלום בבית אלא לעזור לכלל ישראל בכל מכל ברוך השם, חפץ השם בידינו הצליח למעלה ממיליון יהודים ויהודיות נעזרו על ידי ארגונים בעזרת השם. רק תדמיינו לכם איזה עוצמה היה לכל אחד ואחת מהשותפים שזכו להיות כל אחד כפי כוחו ויכולתו, לאיזה תוצאות הצליחו להגיע ולאיזה תוצאות עוד יצליחו. ברפור הוא שמח על לראות את השלטים, נעלה עכשיו למעלה, כמו קצת האש, את הלימוד. ברוכים הבאים, אפשר לראות כאן 
כולם יושבים לומדים, איזה רעש של תורה, איזה רעש, איזה רעש, והנה יש פה עוד בית מדרש. וגם פה יש, השם הכל עמוס. דמיון הזה הוא לא דמיון כל כך רחוק, כי כמו שהתורה אומרת, בפיך או בלבבך לעשותו, ככה גם בדבר הזה. כל מי שירצה, כל מי שרוצה או רוצה להיות שותפים איתנו, עם הארגון הקדוש והנפלא הזה, שכל כוונתו לשם שמיים, להגדיל תורה ולהדירה, להרים קרן התורה, לעזור לכל אחד ואחד מעם ישראל, בכל העניינים, כל המישורים, מי הילד הכי קטן שצריך מטרנה וטיטולים, עד האיש הכי 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 מבוגר. שלעולם לא הניח תפילין, ורגע לפני המוות דואגים להניח לו תפילין. אם גם אתם רוצים להיות שותפים בכאלה דברים גדולים, בעשייה של תורה ועבודה וגמול חסדים, ברוך השם, ארגון בעזרת השם, כאן, לצדכם, לשירותכם, יחד עם כלל ישראל. כמעט מיליון וחצי דיסקים, דיסקונקים, שחילקנו, כל הדברים האלה בחינם, יותר מ-12 אלף שיעורים, אז כל הדברים האלה, מתי שבן אדם רואה כמה ההשקעה שלו, אם זה בבתים, מניות, בכל מיני דברים, והוא רואה שהמניה עלתה 10% במקום אחד, ו-1,000% במקום שני, אז הוא מבין איפה להשקיע פעם הבאה. ואותו דבר פה, יש הרבה אנשים שברוך השם צופים את השיעורים שלנו, שיעורים של הרב אפרים, שיעורים של הרב שרביט, ושאר הרבנים בארגון, ועכשיו זה הזמן להיות שותפים בדבר הגדול שאנחנו עושים ברוך השם. One of the reasons why we do this, why we show these numbers, is because we want to show everyone what we've done to give you an indication. an indication of what we can do in the future. So this is the time where we need as much of your help as possible to push yourself more than you typically do. If you typically donate a couple hundred dollars, donate a thousand. If you, uh, if you can afford uh, the uh, uh, $8,000, $15,000, $50,000, whatever you can afford, this is the time to do it because this is going to be the help that we have to help all of these Avachim, to feed these people and perhaps Bezal Hashem one day to get that building that we've been uh, wanting to, uh, to build here in, uh, in the United States to build a community. But the, all of these things require millions of dollars. If not now, then when? Thank you.